There are many, many Spider-Men in the entire multiverse. What if those Spider-Men had to team up in the Spider-Verse to take down big, bad, ultra villains? That's the storyline today. We're going to be bringing you Spider-Verse, Spider-Geddon, and then the third Spider-Verse, Spider-Verse 3. And this is the comic story and channel where I take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues, and I break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. Then I read them dramatically back to you, giving you a synopsis of the storyline so that you have a general idea of what is happening and allow you to go to your local comic book store or digital retailer to get more context and more of the art. With the new Spider-Man movie coming out, the announcement of the new Spider-Verse movie, we thought it would be a good time to bring you a compilation of all three Spider-Verse comic books. There's Spider-Verse, Spider-Geddon, and Spider-Verse 3. And while they don't directly connect, the same concept applies in all three of them. The enemy is so big and so bad, they need all the spider people to take care of it. Let's get into the first one, the original, the one that kicked off this entire concept, Spider-Verse. Well, he was sent to the year 2099. Superior Spider-Man spent a lot of time gathering up tools, parts, and technology to build himself a time travel device. This is the Superior Spider-Man after all. He isn't going to stay stuck here in this random time period. But not only did he invent a time travel device, he also revived the love of his life, and marie by creating a holographic companion to join him. Even evil villains who take over superheroes' bodies need a little love in their lives, don't they? So Superior Spider-Man finishes working on his time travel device, and he prepares to head home finally. But when he arrives home, something's wrong. He isn't actually home, and this isn't even actually his time. Looking around, he sees a slain Spider-Man just laying down in front of him. And once he turns him over, he discovers that this Spider-Man is a part of the Fantastic Five. But something is wrong. How did this Spider-Man die? So, Superior Spider-Man figures out how he slipped dimensions, and he travels between them. And over, and over, and over, he sees dead Spider-Man. So, after some further analysis, Superior Spider-Man figures out the killer's energy signature, and he figures out how he can track him. So, he portal hops right to our mysterious villain, just in time to save the Spider-Man of India. Superior Spider-Man and Spider-Man of India ride the dimensional portals back to his headquarters, where Superior Spider-Man begins building his army against this unknown threat. Eventually, Superior Spider-Man gets enough Spider-Men together and they launch a full-scale assault against this mysterious foe. Everything seems to be going just as Otto, the Superior Spider-Man, planned. They're winning and they're defeating this foe, but the trap doesn't work. Eventually, his own reinforcements arrive, referring to him as Karn. And the Spider-Man army has to retreat quickly as they're taking injuries and they go back to the year 2099, where Otto storms off, demanding that no one disturb him. He will solve this problem, even if he has to kill this enemy but we'll come back to Superior Spider-Man's army shortly. Let us travel to the universe known as 616. That would be our main universe, where most of the main storylines take place. Peter Parker has crashed from a long night of web-slinging, only to be awoken by Silk deciding to drop by, literally. Now, listeners, we're about to meet a lot of spider people who make up this storyline, and while we've created a series of videos to help you get caught up, I'm going to explain each one of them as we come across them. Now, this is the Spider-Man that you all know and love, and we will be referring to him as Peter Parker for the remainder of this story. The woman hanging upside down is Cindy Moon, and we discovered during the original Sin event that Cindy was bitten by the same radioactive spider as Peter, and due to this, they have a very strong sexual connection. They are starting to have a very strong relationship, but it's not quite there yet. So Peter and Silk go on patrol, and they end up taking down a giant robot, which is trying to rob a bank when something interesting happens. Jessica Drew, whom is Spider-Woman and also an Avenger, along with Anya Corazon, also known as Spider-Girl, show up. And just when Peter is starting to think of this as a spider convention, the Spider-Man of 2099 comes swinging in. Now, he's also known as Miguel O'Hare, and he's currently stuck in our time due to everything going on with Superior Spider-Man. But don't worry, these three spider people are friends of Peter. But the spider people don't stop with his friends. No, Billy Braddock, also known as Spider-UK, and a member of the Captain Britain Corps, drops in. Then Mayday Parker, Peter's daughter from an alternate dimension, shows up. And the cream of the crop, Spider-Ham. Spectacular Peter Porker of Earth-25. Okay, whoa, Peter yells as he stops everyone. What is this, future me, British me, and is that cartoon pig me? And Peter Porker just replies with, yeah, so what do you want to make about it? Peter, still in the shock, replies, I don't know, a luau? Anyone care to explain? So Mayday Parker comes over and removes her mask to show that she is her, that Peter Parker does know her because they've met before. 
So trust her, please. The group explains that they are all from different dimensions and an enemy known as Morlun is traveling between the universes, killing off the Spider-Man of the multiverse. They're all here because they need Peter's help and he is the only Spider-Man who has defeated Morlun multiple times. This is the only Earth that Morlun and his family known as the Inheritors are afraid of, or at least they were. They're on their way here right now. Well, Peter realizes how bad this could be if Morlun arrives again, so he shuffles everyone into the portal and the Peter Parker Spider Army begins. Meanwhile, elsewhere on Earth 616, Morlon's brother is already here, and he's destroying the new warriors while he's trying to feast on Kane. Now, Kane is the clone of Peter Parker from the main universe, who has gone off on his own trials and tribulations to earn the name of Scarlet Spider. He isn't as happy go lucky as Peter, as he's had a much harsher life, and now it appears that he's about to be eaten. But this is Kane, and he's not about to go down without a fight, as he grows spines out of his arms and he stabs the inheritor in the chest. The Inheritor just laughs, so you are the other. As he goes in for the final bite that's going to end Kane's life. And then, in jumps more Spider-Man. Bruce Banner from a world where he got spider powers instead of becoming the Hulk, and Old Man Spider from another world where Peter didn't become a hero. They quickly jump on the Inheritor, distracting him, while Gwen freaking Stacy as Spider-Girl picks up Kane. And it's just as much of a shock to him as it is to us. But before Kane can freak out about Gwen Stacy and assume that it's all another trick from the Jackal, Ben Riley pops in and he explains that they're going to explain everything when they get him to safety. Ben Riley is the other clone, and this version is from a world where he didn't die at the end of the clone story arc. Old Man Spider, Spider Gwen, and Ben Riley all head out of the portal as they watch the Inheritor tear Bruce Banner apart and sacrifice himself so that they can all get away. You had better be worth it, Kane, Old Man Spider says as they leave. All of the spider people converge on the spider refuge, a world where Spider-Man stayed as Captain Universe and therefore has all of the powers of the universe at his disposal. In this world, he can manipulate the very fabric of time and space, and the Inheritors dare not venture here. They count their numbers as 20 strong, and they tell Peter, we need you, you're the strongest one out of all of us. Meanwhile, over in the Ultimate Universe, Miles and this version of Jessica Drew are standing in front of the graveyard visiting the Ultimate Peter Parker's gravesite, when the Inheritors decide to pop in and say hello. But before anyone can even fight, Superior Spider-Man and Spider-Punk both arrive to collect the two younger of the spider totems. Back with Peter Parker, Old Man Spider explains that there is a second group, and it's time for both Spider-Man groups to meet up and combine forces. So they all jump through the portal and into Superior Spider-Man's base of operations with his Spider-Man army. Spider-Man Noir looks at them and he calls out for Superior, Hey, we've got company! And Spider-Monkey looks at Spider-Ham and he yells out, Oh my god, a talking pig! And Spider-Ham just looks at him and says, You're kidding, right? Superior Spider-Man walks out and declares, You idiots! Which of course surprises the entire group. I've been working on a device to help cloak our unique energy signatures that are traveling across the universe, allowing us to hide from the Inheritors, but it only works up to a certain point, and you brought both of the largest signatures to our doorstep. Kane here is a unique signature and is called the Other, and Silk is another unique signature called the Bride. But while Superior Spider-Man is ranting about how this other group screwed everything up, Peter Parker realizes that this is Dr. Octopus. This isn't another Peter Parker. This is happening during the period in which Superior Spider-Man is lost in time. And almost as if on cue, one of the Inheritors comes jumping through a portal. Superior Spider-Man braces himself and he tells everyone, Do not panic! I'm here now! Everyone attack like I've trained you! Everyone jumps in with Ashley Barton, Spider-Girl, Spider-Monkey, and Six-Armed Spider-Man taking point. But the Inheritor just laughs as he punches a hole right through Cyborg Spider-Man, taking him out of the fight. So Spider-Girl, Mayday, Parker, and Kane jump in to continue the assault. But Peter Parker sees the problem. This plan is going to fail. It can't continue. And just as he thinks that, Kane uses the power of the other to spear and kill the Inheritor. Everyone stands there in shock, but within minutes, another version of the same Inheritor, and now his siblings arrive. The fight isn't over yet. Kane turns to Ben Riley and he says, Riley, you thinking what I'm thinking? And Ben says, clone, gotta be. Let's get to their location. So they open a portal back to wherever the clone came from, and then Ultimate Jessica Drew, the female clone of the Ultimate Peter Parker, joins them as the clones go on their own adventure. But we'll come back to the clone adventure 
eventually. Peter Parker realizes that they're losing Spider-Man left and right, and he starts to order everyone to escape out of here. But Silk realizes that the Inheritors are following her energy signature. So she runs past Peter, grabbing one of the fallen Spider-Man's teleporters. Sorry, Peter, but I have to make this right. I'll lead them away. And boom, she's gone. But not before Jessica Drew and Spider-Man Noir follow after her. The rest of the Spider-Army travels back to the world where Spider-Man has kept his powers of Captain Universe. They've gone back to the only safe zone they have, the Spider-Refuge. So there's a bunch of stuff going on, and we're about to go mock speed to get to the good parts again. But basically, we have Silk, Spider-Woman, and Spider-Man Noir on one adventure. We have Kane, Ben Riley, and Ultimate Jessica Drew, whom we will now call Jess from this point, on a different adventure. And we have everyone else retreating back to the safe zone. Back in the safe zone, Peter Parker tells Superior Spider-Man, that he's in charge now. He's the only one who has defeated an inheritor, and the superior Spider-Man plan isn't going to work. Thus, the two men fight it out, and Peter Parker eventually wins because Superior assumes that he would never lose to Peter Parker again. So this Peter Parker must be from his own past, and if Superior Spider-Man hurts him, he could damage his own future. So he backs off for now and lets Peter Parker take over. Meanwhile, Spider-Woman, Silk, and Spider-Man Noir are riding on top of giant lizard donkeys. They're traveling between all of the worlds trying to avoid the Inheritors, who are hot on their trails. Their adventure takes them all over, and eventually, Spider-Man Noir gets injured and needs to be brought back to the home world of Noir. And this adventure turns into Spider-Woman, Silk, and Noir Felicia Hardy fighting against various enemies and gangs trying to get Spider-Man Noir to safety. Eventually, Spider-Woman calls up Peter Parker asking for more help, because, as she puts it, Silk is acting like a child and just running around to all of these universes. I need help, Peter. So Peter sends in Anya and Spider-Gwen to assist, but not before having a little heart-to-heart -heart talk with Spider-Gwen. On Spider-Gwen's world, Peter Parker is the one that they lost, while on the 616 Peter Parker's world, it was Gwen Stacy who died. So they both agree to watch out for each other, and they move forward. Once Peter gets to Jessica, they talk it out, and Peter tells her that they have a much bigger plan for her. But she argues, how could you plan to leave Silk with a couple of teenage bodyguards? So Peter tells her that they don't have a choice. The mission that he has for her is much larger than guarding Silk, and he trusts Anya and Spider-Gwen. So Jessica has a heart-to-heart -heart with both of the ladies, and she tells them to watch Silk carefully, and don't let her get into trouble. They both agree, and Peter and Jessica leave the noir world, and then Anya and Spider-Gwen realize They've already lost track of Silk. Oh crap. Silk has decided to run off on her own because she overheard Peter and Jessica calling her a child, and she figures she'll show them. She'll hide all by herself. While this is going on, Miles Morales is on a separate mission with the Ultimate Spider-Man from the TV show that's on Disney right now to find more Spider-Man, and they currently are swinging through the 1960s television show Spider-Man World. They're trying to build up as many reinforcements as possible as per Peter Parker's orders. It wouldn't be so weird, except that the Disney TV show Spider-Man keeps having these weird daydreaming moments where he breaks the fourth wall. Meanwhile, at the spider safe zone, while our main Peter Parker is away, one inheritor to rule them all arrives in the safe zone. Solus, the father of the inheritors. Captain Universe Spider-Man laughs. You dare come to my world? I have the power of the universe itself in this world. And while I can't leave this world to battle you elsewhere, I have all of the power in the world here. But Solus just laughs at him. You may be all-powerful, but I have inherited the multiverse. And he slams Captain Universe Spider-Man into the ground. He then steps over, and he sucks the life force of the universe right out of him. As he fades away, saying, No, I had ultimate power and ultimate responsibility. Just then, another Inheritor walks over and knocks Mayday Parker on her butt and takes the baby that she has with her. You see, the baby that's with her is her younger brother, Benji, and the only other survivor of her family. If you want to get the full story of her escape with her baby brother, make sure you check out our Mayday Parker video. Anyway, the Inheritor comes over and takes the baby with Mayday screaming, No! You leave my brother alone! But she can do nothing to stop him, as he grabs the baby by the leg and he declares, Father, I have the Scion! You see, I think it's time for you to learn what the Inheritors are doing. The Inheritors are looking for the Other, the Bride, and the Scion for a ritual, a very evil ritual. This ritual will stop the Spider Totems from ever being born again, and if it does that, we'll never have another Spider-Man in the entire multiverse ever again. Morlun takes the child, and he backs in Mayday Parker again, and he leaves this place for good. While she's screaming out, NO! But Morlun taking the child is the least of our worries, as Solus just cuts down as many of these Spider-Men as possible. He's killing them left and right. 
But just then, the main Peter Parker returns with their savior. The Japanese Spider-Man jumping through the portal with their giant Japanese Spider-Man robot, Lepharden. The Solus just starts to tear apart the giant robot, calling it simply a toy. The entire Spider-Man army realizes that this is a losing battle, and they quickly jump worlds to get away. And while Peter Parker is panicking, trying to figure out what they need to do next, Jessica Drew dials back in, and informs Peter that she's currently on Loom World, the home world of the Inheritors, and she has the perfect disguise. You see, the Jessica Drew of this world is one of Morlon's maids, almost as if it was planned out by something like the Master Weaver. You see, the Master Weaver is the one being that controls the fates of everyone, and right now, he's the prisoner of the Inheritors. Peter realizes that her being the maid has to mean more than it actually appears, but he decides to check in on Ultimate Spider-Man and Miles Morales to see how the recruitment is going. They are apparently on a world with a chibi Spider-Man, a cowboy Spider-Man, a catchphrase Spider-Man, and a talking car Spider-Man being chased by the police. Miles replies with, Recruitment is going fine, but this is the moment where my life jumped the shark. And Peter tells them just to keep at it, while Ultimate Spider-Man yells out, Web Warriors, away! And Miles just shakes his head. I never agreed to call us that. Peter then checks in with Spider-Man 2099, and him and Lady Spider are dissecting an inheritor in the future. So they're going to be a while. But before they can share any more information, Genix, one of the Inheritors, taps in. We've been listening to everything you're saying, and now it's time for that to stop. This little Spider-Man army stops today. And just then, the Inheritors arrive on the new world that the Spider-Men are on. The fight rages on once again, but just then, Jessica Drew teleports in a gift from the Master Weaver. The prophecy scrolls that explain everything that's going on. Who the Bride, the Other, and the Scion are, and the future of the Inheritors, and why they're stopping everything. It's all right here. And then, Silk calls up Peter Parker and tells him, Bring everyone to my location. I have found us a new safe zone. The entire Spider Army jumps into World 3145, and immediately the Inheritors stop and refuse to follow. But all of the Spider-Men also get sick right away. This world is irradiated and destroyed. But Silk calls up and tells them to come to a very specific location. And once they all get there, they find a bunker that will protect them from the radiation, along with this world's spider totem, Uncle Ben. For those of you who don't know Spider-Man that well, this is the man that coined the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility. And he died giving Peter Parker the drive and the purpose to become Spider-Man. On this world, it was Uncle Ben who was bitten, and the Green Goblin blew up his home with his wife and his nephew, Peter. So he quit being a superhero, and he forfeited his powers. And while he wasn't being a superhero and hiding in this bunker, Dr. Octopus blew the world up, killing everyone except for Uncle Ben. While he's explaining this to the group, Silk and Spider-Gwen decide that they're going to go to Loom World and rescue Jessica Drew. So poof, they both vanish. While Anya, one of the Spider-Girls of the main universe, sits down and reads the prophecy that Jessica Drew provided to them. The entire Spider-Army finally learns why the Inheritors are hunting them down. The purpose is to stop the Spider-Men from ever being born again, because the prophecy states that eventually, the Spider-Men will rise and defeat the Inheritors. So, Peter realizes that all of this is an easy fix. If the Inheritors just need the Scion, the Bride, and the other, he'll just keep Silk and Kane from even going to Loom World. But when he calls them both up to tell them not to go there, he discovers that Silk just went to Loom World to save Jessica Drew, and Kane went there for revenge. But revenge for what? While we get to that, Peter Parker and Uncle Ben will try to calm down Mayday Parker because she's freaking out right now that Benji, her little brother, is the Scion, and the Inheritors are apparently about to sacrifice her only living family member. So what happened to the clones this entire time? Well, as with most of this story, it's yet another massive tale, so we're gonna have to move through it quickly. Now the clones are Kane, Ben Riley, and Jess, and they've got it all figured out as to where the Inheritors are coming back from, because it's a cloning technology and they used their technology to trace the original portal back to the world where the clones are made. And when they enter that world, they discover a world full of clones. Clones everywhere, and the entire world is run by Genix, one of the Inheritors. So they sneak by an evil Tony Stark, and they go as deep as they can into this world until they eventually arrive at an entire facility filled with Inheritor clones. Jess takes off because she's questioning their purpose. She doesn't understand Kane and his rage, and she doesn't understand Ben Riley's just goofy nature. 
So she decides to climb to the top of the facility where she's going to disconnect the transmitter that the inheritors use to tell their clone to wake up because their main body died. Well, while they're doing this, Ben Riley and Kane discover all of the other clones. And by other clones, I mean Genix's ultimate plan. You see, he was trying to clone the Spider Totem. He's trying to make an endless supply of Spider Totems for his family to feast on so they don't have to go hunting. Well, as they discover all of these Spider Totem clones, Genix arrives to fight it out with them, and Kane begins to lose control. You see, Kane is the other, a being filled with the powers of a spider god, and the angrier he gets, the more he begins to change. Spikes and talons begin to form out of his body, and he begins to beat senselessly on Genix until he eventually kills him. Ben Riley stands there in shock, and Kane tries to get a grip on himself. But none of this matters because a new Genix awakens right there, and he stands up, ready to fight again. And so while their fight continues, Jess tries to get to the top of the building where she's going to turn off the transmitter. But Johnny Storm shows up. You see, this is an evil Johnny Storm who works for Genix. So she begins to battle with him, and she crawls along the top of the building, fighting it out to the best of her ability. Back on the battle down below, Kane begins to lose his steam, and he begins to wear himself out because every time that they tear down Argenix, another wing gets up. And Ben Riley ends up getting sidelined by a dislocated shoulder. Ben realizes that there's only one resolution for this, and as Jess ends her battle with Johnny Storm and she joins the battle against Genix with Kane, Ben begins to go back to the roof, and he grabs every single one of the explosives that are up there. All three of the clones were supposed to go home. All three were supposed to return to their worlds. But Ben Riley, Ben Riley is just always destined to die, isn't he? So he tells Kane and Jess to get away from the building, escape while they can, because at least two of them have to survive. And as Jess drags the injured Kane out of the building, Ben throws the explosives at the tower, taking the entire tower out of the equation. And as it explodes around him, and as he begins to die, he thinks to himself, maybe I can make it out of this one too. Kane looks up furious. Ben Riley had to die again? And he tells Jess, stay here. He has a monster inside of himself that the inheritors are scared of, and he's gonna bring it to him. So he strands her in this world as he leaps through a portal into Loom World, prepared to end this himself. We now go back to Peter Parker calling into Kane and Kane responding in a very angry tone that he's already in Loom World to end this. It was time to stop running, because they can't clone themselves anymore. So Kane lets it all go. He lets the other take control, and the powers of a spider god begin to course through his veins, and he changes into a monstrous, hulking spider beast. The inheritors arrive to the pulse of the other awakening on their own world, and they stand there in awe at his power at first. And then Kane begins to wreck them, throwing them around like flies and growling at them until he gets an open shot at Solus, the father of the Inheritors himself. And he impales him with his spikes on his arms, killing Solus. And Solus doesn't have a clone anymore to revive himself with. But this just pisses off Morlun as he jumps onto Kane and tears off one of his own spider talons and shoves it through the back of Kane's head, killing him right there. Kane falls to the ground and the inheritors drag his body off to their home to get ready for their ritual. Meanwhile, back with Peter Parker, he realizes that they need to move again. They've convinced Uncle Ben to get ready for the fight, and Mayday has calmed down enough that all of them are ready to go to Loom World. He calls into Miles and the Ultimate TV Peter Parker, and he tells them, get to Loom World now, we're ending this. And Miles tells Peter that the Web Warriors will swing by and pick up Jess, and then get there. And Ultimate TV Spider-Man is just so happy that Miles finally said it. He called them the Web Warriors! Superior Spider-Man and Peter Parker prep the portal, and Superior yells out, The die is cast! But Peter stops him. Hey, I'm the one running the show. I get the big line. Spider-Friends, go for it! And Spider-Ham just says, Nailed it! Silk, Spider-Gwen, and Jessica Drew all get back with the team, and Ultimate Jess jumps in at first, yelling, We're not losing one more man today! And Spider-Ham says, or woman. And Jess says, or woman. And Spider-Ham says, or pig. And Jess says, shut up. All right, whatever listeners, you stayed on this long, I owe you a resolution. The battle rages on with the Spider-Men teaming up against the Inheritors. And the Inheritors don't have extra clone bodies, so there's no more dying and coming back. 
the Spider-Man would probably not have won, except that they have one Inheritor on their side. You see, there's an exiled brother of the Inheritors that joined up because he didn't believe in killing off the Spider-Man, and he was promised that if he helped them win, they could find him an alternate food source, so he agreed to join them. This Inheritor is Karn, the Inheritor that Superior first met at the beginning of our story, and I'm sorry that we don't have time to go into that extra story, but we're already way over our time limit here. They fight and they fight until Morlun realizes that the Inheritors may lose. So he runs to the baby that's suspended in the Master Weaver web. The baby that once killed will end all of the spider totems forever. And he gets ready to kill him finally. Only to be kicked by a hoof in the face. You see, while Morlun was fighting, Peter Parker swapped the baby with Spider-Ham. At the start of this battle, Uncle Ben took Benji and he returned back to their original world. Morlun is furious! How could their plan be unraveling? Everything was going so perfectly for the Inheritors. And Peter tells him that this is all a part of his plan. You're done, Morlun. And he yells into the communicator, Spider-Man 2099, do it now. And just then, Spider-Man 2099 comes riding in on a repaired Leopardon, the giant Japanese robot Spider-Man. The fight rages on with the Inheritors obviously losing until eventually Superior Spider-Man decides to enact his own plans. And he jumps over everyone and kills the Master Weaver. Everyone stands there. The Weaver of life itself, of existence, has been murdered in this fight. Morlun begins to fill to the brim with rage and he jumps on Peter Parker. If he's going to lose, he's going to at least finally get his revenge on the 616 Peter Parker. So Peter Parker opens one final portal, and he warps himself and Morlun into the radioactive world, the one world that the Inheritors can't survive on. Peter's ready to die there, let the radiation just overwhelm him. But Silk has his back, and she throws down a lifeline and brings him back to Loom World. And that's it. Karn throws each of his family members into the radioactive world. Without clones or a way to travel the multiverse, they'll be stuck in that world without power. And Peter just sits there in Silk's arms. His life force is drained away, weakening him, but he'll survive. After a brief time of relaxing, the Spider Army parts ways back to their homeworlds. First up is Mayday Parker, who returns to her world where she lost her father, mother, and boyfriend. And when she gets there, she's in shock because her boyfriend survived, and he pulled Mary Jane out of the fire. Both of them lived, and Uncle Ben decided to stay there to do something that an Uncle Ben has never gotten to do become a grandfather to Mayday Parker and Benji. Mayday is sad to see that her father didn't survive the battle with the Inheritors, but Mary Jane gives her the Spider-Man suit and asks her to carry on the title, become what her father wanted, become Spider-Woman. Miles and Ultimate Jess bid their farewells with Miles wishing that the adventure had lasted longer, like their last one which was so cool. And after a bit of struggling, Superior Spider-Man is sent back to his time and place, and since it involves a bit of time travel, he'll forget everything that ever happened. Karn then takes over as the Master Weaver, and the Spider-Man of the Captain Britain Corps and Anya stay at the Web of Fate to become the new Web Warriors. So the rest of the 616 Spider-Men and Spider-Women all head home. Home to relax, and finally not have to deal with all this crazy multiverse Spider-Verse stuff. It's Earth-138. The streaks in New York are quiet, well, sort of. The big man is thrown into the alleyway, clad in biker clothes, slamming into the ground, and his attacker follows up closely behind. I got two rules, Thunderstrike! And from the shadow steps Spider-Man. Jean vest, baseball bat, and metal spikes coming out of his head. This is Spider-Punk, the anarchist of the Spider-Verse. Spider-Punk doesn't like gods or monsters, and the massive man on the ground fits both those descriptions. Thunderstrike tries to struggle to his feet, but gets a swift kick from Spider-Punk's high tops. Leaning in, Spider-Punk informs Thunderstrike, You better leave, but your hammer is staying here, or we're gonna have a little Ragnarok and roll. Before he could say a word, a blast of energy snaps out, hitting Thunderstrike. Light fills the alleyway, and where he once lay is only a pile of ash. Spider-Punk backs away, looking over his shoulder. That also sends a message, he quips, before him floats a strange being in a purple suit. Energy crackling out of his hands. It is Kang, the Conglomator. Raising his bat, Spider-Punk prepares for battle, yet Kang is not who he thinks he is. Spider-Punk simply stares, so Kang tells him his future. 
In the year 2099, Kanko owns all likeness rights to Spider-Punk's image, and with this, he makes millions in merchandising. Everything but the comics. The comics don't really sell that well. Realizing that he has become a sellout in the future, and it isn't even his fault, Spider-Punk becomes enraged. You're a dead man, he screams. Yet Kang pays him no attention and continues his monologue. He intends to take Spider-Punk back with him to the future. While pictures and movies are great, the real thing would make him billions. And Spider-Punk glares. You and what army? And as if on cue, more strange lights begin to fill the alleyway and Kang is surrounded by Spider-Punk looking egg things. The short-armed, egg-bodied Spider-Punks leap at our hero, who starts swinging his bat for all that he's worth. There are too many, though, and he's quickly overwhelmed by the strange creatures. Kang begins to laugh. This is why people love Spider-Punk. The struggle, the fighting against overwhelming odds. And suddenly, the creatures go flying and Spider-Punk emerges, his costume torn and one eye exposed. He thwips away, reaching for his cell phone as the creature begins to give chase. He's gonna need backup. Across the city, Captain Anarchist is fighting the Annihilation Wave for putting on a surf concert in Harlem. Something about those bugs and surf music, I, I don't know. Spider-Punk is on his way and he needs the tape. Captain Anarchist is shocked. The tape? And Spider-Punk needs the atom bomb. Dropping next to his friend, Spider-Punk prepares to fight alongside Captain Anarchist. But they don't have to. Right behind him are the strange egg creatures who immediately start fighting with the Annihilation Wave bugs. With their moment of rest, Captain Anarchist hands the tape over to Spider-Punk but is knocked away by one of the creatures as they're thrown into him. Spider-Punk reacts quickly with his webbing shooting out to stop it, but not before it's down the throat of one of the bugs from the Annihilation Wave. Jumping to the creature, Spider-Punk pries it out of his mouth like he's a dog. Finally getting the tape, Spider-Punk and Captain Anarchist are greeted by the arrival of Kang. Spider-Punk warns Anarchist about Kang, but the future businessman looks at Anarchist with contempt. He has no need for Captain Anarchist. The man isn't profitable in the future. No one cares about him. And with that insult, Captain Anarchist leaps to attack Kang, hoping to give Spider-Punk some time as he thwips away. Racing through the city on his web line, Spidey finally arrives on a rooftop, and sitting there is his mohawked friend, Robbie. Spidey's gonna need Robbie, who angrily knocks away the tape that Spider-Punk is holding out. He's out, and he's not helping anymore. Kang arrives in the street below, and breaking away from his glaring argument with Robbie, Spider-Punk leaps down to meet him. He can't beat Kang, but he's not going down without a fight. The two begin their epic battle, and on the rooftop, Robbie watches before finally putting the tape into his Walkman. The music fills his ears. His eyes begin to flash green. The roar fills the night air as a massive figure leaps off the building, its fist coming straight down with gigantic force onto Kang's body. Spider-Punk cheers as Punk Hulk and Kang begin to fight it out. Kang's energy blasts begin to bounce off the Hulk's body, having little effect. Hulk grabs Kang, swinging him around, his body battering into the walls and street around them. Finally broken and defeated, Kang lays there. Spider-Punk asks, standing over his defeated enemy with a now slightly calmer Hulk. Why me? Why not Captain Anarchist? In the future, Anarchist died an old man that no one paid attention to anymore. But Spider-Punk, you died young, like every great bankable star. And with those final ominous words, Kang disappeared. Glaring at the spot where he once was, Spider-Punk finally turns to his green friend, but the two don't get to celebrate long as new energy fills the streets. Before them, a blue portal opens up and through its steps, Mayday Parker, Spider-Woman. Something big is happening in the multiverse. Something that needs them all together again. Spider-Punk hesitates for a moment and then steps through into the Spider-Geddon. Earth 14512. Class has just ended. The teacher is making sure that the students remember their homework for the weekend. Happy to finally be finished for the day, Penny Parker is trying to get her things together. She's interrupted, however, by a new student who tries to introduce herself, Addie Brock. The white-haired girl extends her hand. Penny doesn't shake it. And she lets the girl know that if she wants to be cool, she shouldn't be seen talking to Penny. What Addie really wants, though, is to know if the rumors are true. Is Penny the pilot of the spider suit, the protector of the city? Penny doesn't want to talk about that and runs out of class. But the new girl, Addie, follows her seemingly angered by Penny's refusal to talk. You think that you're so special, but you're not, Penny finally gets away, hearing one last yell from over her shoulder. Everyone is afraid to tell you what they really think because your father died. And with those parting words, Penny is gone. Back in the Parker residence, Penny walks in on her aunt and uncle discussing something called the Sim Engine, and the UN wanted to test it out. When questioned about it, Aunt May and Uncle Ben changed the subject, quickly asking about how her day was. Am I special, she asks. Her aunt and uncle reassure her that she is special. That's why she can pilot the spider suit. Yet, 
She's just one part of the team. And they're doing everything that they can to make sure that she's not out there on her own. But they won't elaborate on what they mean, and with that, Penny storms away in frustration, locking herself into her room. Later, May is working on the spider suit, trying to repair some of its weapons, while Penny doodles anime characters on the arms. Glancing over her shoulder, Penny suddenly sees Addie Brock. Walking through the hallways in a combat suit, slipping away from her aunt, Penny follows behind the new student. Suddenly peeking around the corner, Penny is shocked to discover a new combat mech, the Venom suit. Penny glares as she sees Uncle Ben talking to Addie, praising her connection with the Sim engine in the Venom suit. Her anger is interrupted, though, when the alarms begin to blare and running through the hallway, Penny quickly gets back into the spider suit, ready to deploy. Later, the spider deploys into the city to meet with the Morbius creature, a strange tentacled monster that is sucking energy out of the city. Penny jumps into action, whipping the creature's tentacles from the power sources that they are attached to. Her aunt and uncle giving her tactical advice over the comms. Citizens of the city run in fear as the combat armor and creature are locked into battle. But Penny begins to lose power as the creature's tentacles begin to wrap around the spider suit. Now completely drained, the suit is thrown away, and Penny is sitting angrily in the dark. She needs backup, and enter Addy in the Venom suit. The new mecha moves in fast, arm blades slicing through the Morbius tentacles. Uncle Ben is ordering her to stop. They want Morbius alive, but the suit, the Venom suit, it's not responding, and it's moving as if it's on its own. In the cockpit, Addy begins to hear voices. We can't go back. They'll kill us. It tells her. Wires begin to move throughout the cockpit, sliding and wrapping around Addie. We are now in control. Addie is no longer responding, and Ben and May can't shut down the suit from the control room, so they have no choice. Venom looks up as the chopper glides closer, and May descends from a ladder. Getting inside of the cockpit, May is shocked to see Addie. The suit is alive now, with its wires trapping her. Addie seems barely there anymore, her eyes a blank glaze. The voice that is issued from her throat isn't hers, and May tries to help, but the wires begin to engulf her as well. She screams for Ben over the radio, but then all is silent. Ben has managed to get power back to the spider suit. Springing back up, Penny locks into combat with the Venom suit, trying to save her aunt. The suit is more animal than machine now, with a long tongue of wires sliding out of its mouth. Venom is faster and more heavily armed, and Spider tries to stop it, but she can't. Venom pins her down, and the spider is cracked and dented with each blow. Addie is gone. May is gone. We are Venom! The words come out of the suit, and Penny stares in horror, but May managed to fix the web shooters earlier that day, and they work now. Pinning Venom to the wall, Spider gets up, ripping the cockpit out of the Venom. But there's nothing there but wires. No pilot, no Aunt May. Later, Ben brings Penny a coffee in her room, and he tells her that what happened is not her fault. They can grieve together. Suddenly the room is full of light as a portal opens up against one wall and from it emerges Peter Porker. The multiverse needs all of the spider people that it can get, and Uncle Ben knows that the universe needs her. So Penny steps through the portal with the pig. On an unknown earth, in a bar called Stacy's, Ben Parker is parked at the counter. He stares down at the dead phone in his hands, and next to him a man is webbed to the counter. Struggling against his bonds, the bartender is a friendly sort, offering to charge the phone while he hands Ben a beer. The criminal tries to struggle some more and is rewarded with a blow from Ben's fist. Drinking his beer, Ben tells the bartender his story. You see, some time ago, Ben has fallen while coming out of the subway. His heart had given up on him, and he was lying down on the paint that spilled when he dropped it. His breath had come in gasps as the people of New York simply walked around him, completely ignoring someone in distress. And a little while later, Peter is watching a video of Spider-Man webbing up Jameson as he sits in the doctor's waiting room. In the office, Ben and May have just heard awful news. But should they tell Peter? May doesn't want to. Let's just let him be a kid for a little while, she suggests. Another time jump. Peter is outside the pharmacy while Ben learns that his health insurance won't cover his heart medication. Instead, he gets some pain medication and exits the pharmacy to discover that Peter isn't where he left him. Peter can't help himself and is posing as Spider-Man for people with their phones. This is unknown to Ben, though, who starts to walk down the street, not seeing the man shadowing him quickly or the gun that he pulls. The shots, they echo throughout the street, and the blood transfusion from Peter saved Ben's life. It was some time later before Ben discovered that it also gave him powers. That was when Ben knew that Peter was actually Spider-Man. He wasn't posing that day. Ben began to help Peter, stepping in to save him from the wrecker. 
The old man doesn't really know much about the superhero business, but he's tough. He can put up a fight. They argue. Is it right for them to stop the wrecker? And Ben learns that he was just defending his neighborhood from the developers who were trying to put people out of their homes. Peter counters. But what if he hurt someone doing it? The two begin to work together, stopping villains while Peter tries to decide on what their names should be. Apparently Spider-Ben and Petey was too on the nose. The two worked well together fighting crime, even taking part in the big spider war. And then it all went wrong. Itsy Bitsy Spider, the grave red. The dirt shook and trembled as Ben punched his way out of the grave, gasping for breath. He didn't have time to rest, he needed to save Petey. The rain fell as the lightning flashed over the house in the distance, and Ben Parker stalked his way forward, thoughts of stealth and secrecy gone. Inside, the sounds of Ben's fists impacting with the Craven the Hunter's face could be heard over the rain and the thunder. The questions didn't matter, and they only served as punctuation for each blow. Ben is finally interrupted as Petey, still groggy from the drugs, tells him that Craven fed him. He hugs Ben, scared. This is over. We're done, Ben told him. But Petey argued. Why does he get to decide that? Then Petey sees Craven, his face a bloody mess, and shocked and horrified at what Uncle Ben did. Petey picks him up, and he carries him out. But he tried to kill me, Ben whispers, not understanding his nephew. Ben has finished his story and his beer. The phone is finally charged with a few parting words. Ben exits the bar. You never know how long you have in this world. And Ben knows that better than anyone. Petey and May may be long gone, but he's still here. He stares down at the phone, a sad smile playing over his face as he sees pictures of him and Petey. On another unknown earth, Harry Osborn has arrived. The red sports car parked in front of the massive tower that is Oscor Plaza. Inside, security informs his father that he is on the premises in his chambers. Norman watches the cameras that fall from the ceiling like webs. In the lobby, Harry is greeted by security. And they take his arm and they escort him up. He doesn't argue. In the elevator, now he waits for them to push the button for the penthouse. Then his hands begin to move quickly, pulling out his concealed tasers. The guards fall from the single shock, with the last taking a knuckle duster to the chin. Harry disregards his jacket and steps out of the elevator. He needs something before he meets his father. Back at his chambers, Norman questions why he even bothers with security, his forearms flexing as he climbs down from his platform. The letter that Harry received from his friend Peter told him everything that his father was doing. It told him how to stop him. It told him where the kobold armor was. And donning it now, the mask locked in a wide-toothed grin of the trickster kobolds of myth. Harry slipped through the building silently, finally arriving in his father's inner chamber. Beneath the mask, Harry's eyes go wide. His father, clad in armor, descends from the ceiling, his forearms clinging to the walls. But that doesn't surprise Harry. What does is the wrapped cosmic cube in the center of the room. The broken key to reality that does little more than show images of what might have been. And the images of Peter Parker as the amazing Spider-Man. Norman Osborn as the villain Green Goblin. And Harry eventually taking over for him. The two fight, father and son trading blows, but even in this enhanced armor, Harry is no match for his father's strength and he falls to the ground beaten and bloodied. Norman stands over him, triumph on his face. Harry's foot comes up, smashing his father in his uh, egg sack and doubling him over. With his last burst of strength, Harry fires a shot from his wrist to launcher, the round going over Norman's shoulder, shattering the cosmic cube. In the room is every version of Norman standing there at once, his years of planning ruined by a single moment. Harry's last images is him and his friend Peter, or a version of them. The building then explodes. But Norman isn't dead. The explosion has sent him into the cube, into the very webs that hold the multiverse together, and this is what he wanted. This is how it should have ended. Suddenly, a web line hits his back, and he screams, No! as he is pulled away by none other than Spider Punk. And back on Earth 616, Dr. Otto Octavius has taken up residence in San Francisco. Once, he was one of Spider-Man's greatest villains. Then for a short time, he became Spider-Man. But not just Spider-Man, he was the superior Spider-Man, doing the things that the true hero couldn't bring himself to do. Since returning as a clone of his younger self, Otto has decided to try and become an even better hero, the superior octopus. 
The bus travels down the street on a quiet night, and with that, the conversations have ended by a shovel being thrown through the front window. Shocked, the driver swerves, and the bus begins to tip over. The roof is suddenly peeled away, and the patrons are shocked to see the supervillains Digger, Dance Macabre, Skyne, Waxman, and the brothers Grimm. The villains begin to collect everyone's valuables as they're attacked, but the superior octopus arrives on the scene, his arms throwing the brothers Grimm away, while the Digger is blinded by his ink shooters. The villains don't even stand a chance. Otto stands already triumphant as his mechanical arms do most of the work. He had prepared for this fight by modifying the arms to fight each of these villains' powers, and they were quickly defeated. Instead of arresting them though, Otto makes them an offer. Work for him as his agents in protecting the city, and they will earn more than they could ever steal. They agree and Otto heads back into the night. Returning to his base just as the sun comes up, he doesn't have much time though, and he quickly changes. When not superheroing, Otto is Professor Tolliver at Horizon University. All of his crime fighting a supervillain past can't prepare Otto for what's about to happen though, running into his ex-girlfriend. Well, actually it's Peter Parker's ex-girlfriend from when Otto was living inside of Peter Parker's brain. Otto still has feelings for her, but since they've never actually dated, it's hard for him to work with her every day. Later that night, the superior octopus has just managed to save some civilians from a bridge collapsing. While a hero now, Otto still finds it difficult to get away from his former supervillain ways, and it doesn't help when he's questioned by the local authorities about his past. Returning to his base of operations, Otto is surprised to find Arnim Zola and the members of Hydra waiting him, the members that he once worked with when he was taking down Parker Industries. Zola is eager to continue working with Otto to bring back the glorious return of Hydra, but Otto's a hero now, right? and he wants nothing to do with Hydra. Once one is Hydra, one remains Hydra, and hold death! The Hydra agents open fire, forcing Otto to leap into action, his arms making quick work of the Hydra goons though, leaving only him and Zola until he is struck from behind. Spinning back, he's shocked to see the Gorgon, or at least a life model decoy of the villain. The samurai faces against Otto with mechanical arms clashing against Katana Steel. Even a fake Gorgon is fast though, and one of Otto's limbs is quickly severed. The two trade blows with Otto's arms giving him the upper hand, and eventually one of the bladed tips slashes the ribbon away from Gorgon's eyes. Too late though, as Otto realizes his mistakes, because the Gorgon's eyes are his greatest weapons. Otto tries to react, but he feels his limbs growing heavy as his body turns to stone. By Zola's order, the Gorgon swings his blade, smashing the statue of Otto to pieces, filling the room with the dust of Otto's former body. So end the enemies of Hydra, Zola gloats with Otto's head in his hands. But from the dust, a blade swings, severing the head of the Gorgon. The dust clears, revealing the superior octopus standing with the Gorgon's head clutched in the grip of one of his mechanical arms. Impossible, Zola screams, shock showing on his digitized face. The Hydra members try to stop Otto, a blast of energy shooting from his head cannon. But Otto is too fast, springing across the room on his metal arms. With quick movements, he tears Zola's body to pieces, ridding himself of the enemy. But how did he survive? How has he returned to us, you may be asking yourself? Staring at his cloning machines, which use the technology that he took from the war against the Inheritors during the Spider-Verse. Nothing can stop him now. He is immortal. He is superior. Who can stand against an ever-cloning superior octopus? Well, on Earth-01, known as the Loom World, the Inheritors have heard the signal of their technology. Using the tech from the Spider Army, they begin to send out their own signal, looking for their own escape. On Earth 1048, swooping around the city, Spider-Man's ears are assaulted by the rantings of J. Jonah Jameson over his podcast. Why do I torture myself? But that torture quickly ends when Mary Jane calls him instead. It's not a quick call from a girlfriend, though. It seems like the newsroom just got a tip about a spider-themed villain robbing a bank. The last thing Spidey needs is bad publicity, and so he swings into action. Arriving on the scene, Spider-Man is greeted by the Tarantula, a villain armed with mechanical arms. The two begin to fight, and Spidey dodges the Tarantula's arms while using his web bombs on him. Before he can deliver the finishing blow, however, he's interrupted by the superior Spider-Man. Not sure why a second spider-based villain has appeared, the two begin to trade blows. But with a spider sense and heightened agility, keeping the both of them from even touching each other, Spider-Man finally realizes that this man, the superior Spider-Man, is another hero. Unfortunately, this gives the Tarantula just enough time to free himself. Two Spider-Men working together isn't always a good idea, because then the two of them begin to get into each other's ways, becoming trapped in a web bomb. Finally freeing themselves, both Spider-Men retreat to the rooftop so they can finally talk. 
So the superior Spider-Man fills in this Peter Parker on the cliff notes as to how we've gotten here. There's alternate realities, there are hundreds of Spider-Men, and there are inheritors. Vampire creatures trying to steal the energy of Spider-People. It's a lot to take in. And the fact that Superior Spider-Man is also actually Otto Octavius is kind of thrown into the mix. But it's nice knowing that in another world, Otto Octavius, the mentor for this Spider-Man, isn't just a villain that betrayed Peter in the past, but he does have the ability to become a hero. Peter understands that the Spider Army needs him, that the Inheritors are returning, but he can't just abandon his world. He needs to stop the Tarantula. Superior understands and he agrees to help. Catching up with the Tarantula, the two Spider-Men work better this time, attacking the villain. Tarantula is well armed though and the two can't get through his defenses. Luckily, Otto knows a thing or two about mechanical arms and using his sophisticated spider bots, he overrides the Tarantula's mental link with his weapons. With the supervillain defeated, Peter has to make a few stomps and he checks in with Miles Morales, a friend who has been developing his own set of powers. His girlfriend, Mary Jane, whom he shares a loving embrace with before going off to war. With this taken care of, he joins Otto Octavius, traveling through the multiverse to stop the Spider-Geddon. In Spider-Geddon, the Inheritors have recently risen, and they've begun work on cloning their bodies and raising their father. But Morlun, the Inheritor, leaves on a more personal mission. He chooses to not be a part of the main Spider-Geddon event. Three times has the Spider-Man of Earth 616 beaten him. There shall not be a fourth. The bodies in the ground guide and co-pilot are left at the tarmac in a pool of their own blood as the private jet takes off. Morlun watches over the shoulder of the sweating pilot as the lights of New York near them. Maybe he'll let him live, the pilot probably hopes. The plane begins to plummet with wind rushing through the cabin and over the pilot's limp, dead body as Morlun opens the door. The wind buffets him, whipping through his hair as he leaps out into the night, the city before him. Crashing into the waters below, Marlon begins to make his way to the shore. Elsewhere in the city, though, Spider-Man just finished up capturing a group of bank robbers, quips and webs flying around the room. Walking past the large stacks of money the men have been able to steal, he peers out the window and he's greeted by the red and blue flashes of the police. Hey look, that's my cue! Flipping out the window, he shoots a web and he swings away. Morning, boys. The bad guys are all webbed up for you. You're welcome, he calls to the incoming officers. How about the paperwork, one wonders. As an exhausted Peter swings across the city, the sun begins to peek over the buildings on the horizon, bringing a groan from our hero. If he gets home now, he should have almost a full hour and a half before he has to start his day. I should get a cab. As if on cue, Pete's spider sense begins to kick in, giving him enough time to flip out of the way as the taxi comes sailing through the air. Holy crud! Webb shoot out, tying the cab quickly before it can crash and hurt somebody. Pulling the driver clear, his spider sense kicks in again as a mail truck careens towards him. Spider-Man is barely able to stop it before it can crush the taxi driver. As Peter begins to wonder what is causing all of the crazy traffic, more Lun comes strolling down the street. Oh God, is the only thing that he can think of. You have managed to evade me three times before. No more games, today I feed, Spider. The vampire hisses with his eyes glowing red. Spider-Man doesn't hesitate, and despite his exhaustion, he leaps towards the villain. Morlun is fast, however, with his fist coming up to meet Spider-Man's chest. Spider-Man throws a punch, but Morlun easily dodges it with his superior speed. Another blow drops Spidey, drawing blood and tearing his mask at the mouth. Blood begins to curl from his lips. Morlun doesn't slow down as kicks and punches rain down upon him. Pete needs to get away and he shoots webbing, blinding Morlun, giving him a few precious seconds. The bumper from the taxi acts as a bat as Spidey swings for the fences, but with Morlun down, he doesn't hesitate. Pete runs. He can't lead Morlun back to where he lives, so he calls in some backup. Pulling out his cell phone, he dials the number. Uh, hello? A groggy voice answers. Jonah! Pete yells as he runs, Morlun already on his tail. At his home, Jonah sits up in bed questioning if Peter even knows what time it is. Admitting he doesn't, Pete then asks Jonah for help. He needs something from his apartment and he can't get it himself. Knowing Peter's secret now, Jonah starts getting dressed as he explains where his web watch is in his apartment. Jonah, please hurry. This is pretty serious. You can count on me, Jonah answers as he runs out the door. Hanging the phone up just as Morlun catches up, Peter is tackled from the sky. The two crash into a construction site, with the workers scattering away from the impact. Peter then struggles out of the wreckage, his costume torn, his body broken. Is the whole world bleeding eternally, or is it just me? 
Enough! Morlun stands above him, a jackhammer in his hands as he plunges towards Peter. But Spider-Man stops the blade inches from his face, gritting his teeth with the strain. Hurry, Jonah. At Peter's apartment, Jonah is pushing past his roommate Randy, moving for Peter's room. How hard could it be to find a watch? Except for the fact that the room is mostly a pile of garbage and broken furniture. Back at the fight, Spider-Man comes crashing through the window of a mattress store, his exhausted body landing on some memory foam. Oh, come on. This isn't fair. He struggles to get up, but the bed is just so comfortable. And he's so tired. He falls back down. Five more minutes. But that's when Morlun steps through the broken window. Spider. All right, I'm up. Pete struggles off the bed with Morlun standing before him. There seems to be no escape, but using his webbing to bring down the ceiling as Morlun lunges, Peter gets a small window of escape once again. Swinging away, he answers his phone as Jonah calls to him, trying to find the watch. Well, to mostly yell at him about how much his room is a mess, but Peter tells Jonah to meet him in Central Park. A line goes dead just as Jonah manages to find the web watch. Later, Jonah is running through the park, calling out to Spider-Man's name. This is insane! I'm never gonna find him! He hops as he catches his breath, but almost on cue, Spider-Man comes falling out of the trees, landing on the ground heavily. You look like drop lasagna! Jonah notes as he surveys Peter's broken body. Specific! He groans. Helping Peter to his feet, Jonah hands him the watch, and Peter orders Jonah to run as he straps it on. But it's too late, and Morlun is rushing at them, his hands gripping Peter's wrist, destroying the web watch that would have allowed him to jump into the multiverse. He falls back as Morlun begins to feed on his life essence. Jonah, watching in horror. Drop him, Morlun! I mean it! Miles orders as he lands in the park. The other spider. The lesser spider. Morlun hisses as he drops Peter, turning and rushing fast into Miles. Pinning him to the ground, Miles tries to use his Venom Strike, but it doesn't seem to have much of an effect on the vampire. He tries again, this time aiming for the creature's eyes. Morlun staggering back with a roar. The momentary blindness was all Peter and Jonah needed. Realizing that his prey has escaped, Morlun moves to chase. Trying to slow him down, Miles shoots some webs, but is punched and thrown away. Further away, Jonah is trying to get Peter to safety, but Pete wants to go back and help Miles. I'm shocked you're able to stand, Jonah tells him. You should see the other guy. Oh wait, you did, and he looked fantastic. Never mind. Stopping on the bridge, Peter takes a second to web his broken arm into a sling. He suddenly slams into Jonah, throwing him off the bridge, just in time as Morlun comes flying in. Grabbing Spider-Man, Morlun leaps away, but Peter struggles free, falling back to the earth. He lands hard again, struggling to his feet to see that he landed at the entrance to the zoo. Moving inside, he slowly tries to get away. Moving through the exhibits, Peter is tired and broken. He just wants to sit down, but he can't. He has to keep moving. He turns, envious of some monkeys that are sleeping in their enclosure. But that's when the answer to stopping Morlun hits him. He moves, trying to find what he needs when Miles comes flipping in. He wants to help Peter defeat the Inheritor, but Peter needs him to go. He needs Morlun to be focused on only him, and he needs Miles to lead the other spiders in stopping the rest of the Inheritors. Following Peter's lead, Miles and Peter web Morlun's feet, springing away. He slips inside of one of the zoo cafes, but they still have to slow down Morlun, so they create a gas leak and turn on the burners. The spiders then both escape out the back as Morlun comes in, the building exploding. Knowing this won't slow down Morlun for long, they keep moving, with Peter finally finding what he needs in a service shed tranquilizers. Miles still does not like the idea of leaving Peter behind, but Pete knows that only Miles can lead the rest of the spiders and stop the inheritors. Opening a portal, Miles steps through, leaving Peter with one final word. You got it, Pete. Alone, Pete begins to gear up and outside in the park, Jonah has called in the SWAT team and they're preparing to come in. As Morlun pulls himself from the fiery wreckage of the zoo cafe, Peter loads up on tranks. Now armed with a rifle, pistol, and a bandolier of darts, he cuts his mask to try and cover his face ninja style. He's had enough. Morlun, now dressed in a zoo t-shirt, stalks his prey. From the treetops, Peter gets the vampire in his sights and he fires, the dart hitting Morlun in the neck. Snatching it free, he seems a little more than annoyed. You simpleton, I am an inheritor from a clan of hunters older than time, built to hunt and kill you. Do you think a sedative will slow me down? He screams into the trees. A second dart hits him in the neck. With Peter smiling beneath his mask, he reloads and targets Morlun again. 
freeze. The SWAT officers, not knowing what they're getting into, begin to move in on Morlun. The vampire reacts, grabbing the closest officer's arm and snapping it with one movement. Spider-Man leaps in, kicking Morlun free of the officer, and then using another dart, he stabs it into the vampire's neck like a knife. Stay back, I got this! If the sedatives are having any effect, it's not showing. And Morlun throws Spider-Man off of him with ease. The police don't hesitate, they open fire, but the rounds don't even seem to slow Morlun down as he begins to stalk closer. Behind him, Jonah pops out of the bushes, trying to get Peter out of there and let the cops do their job. But Peter knows that if he leaves, Morlun will kill everyone. Telling Jonah to get the cops back, Peter reacts in time to shoot Morlun with another dart before the villain kicks him away. As the police begin to pull back, it's just Spider-Man and Morlun once again. He pulls another dart and moves in fast, stabbing Morlun in the eye. Enraged, the monster kicks the hero away, knocking him into one of the animal enclosures. Pete stands up, seeing a bear staring at him. The animal charges just as Morlun comes in. With a spinning kick, Spider-Man manages to keep both attackers at bay, and a second kick sends the bear into the water, keeping it and Spider-Man safe. Once again, he's alone with Morlun, yet the vampire seems to finally be feeling the effects of the drugs. Tired yet? Peter asks. I don't tire, I feed! Morlun hisses as he attacks, but he's slower. Peter flips over him to attack him back, webbing him and throwing him to the ground. Webbing him up some more, Spider-Man retreats again, hoping to finally end the fight. Snapping the webbing, Morlun follows him into the Penguin Building. Darkness and honking surrounds him, and that's when he sees the spider silhouetted in the doorway. He charges, but Spider-Man moves, and Morlun runs headfirst into an animal cage. Morlun roars in anger as the police encircle him. Fire at will, gentlemen. And with these words, the police open fire with trank rounds. The darts all hitting Morlun until he falls, sleeping in a puddle of his own drool. Thanking the police and Jonah for their help, Peter finally manages to get away and he returns to his apartment. He falls into his bed exhausted, his eyes closing as blissful sleep begins to overtake him. Peter! He opens one eye to see Spider-Gwen come swinging in out of another web portal. The inheritors have returned and we need your help! Peter sits up. Tell me on the way. You weren't sleeping, were you? Gwen asks as they step into the portal. Of course not. Not when there's work to be done. High above the streets of New York, Miles Morales is fighting against the Vulturons. Four vulture-suited supervillains that are so laughable, the other Spider-Man doesn't even mention them. Using his venom shock and superior agility, Miles easily stays ahead of the second-rate villains, smashing two of them together. One of the vultures lands amongst a rooftop party. Pulling out a pistol, he waves it at the innocent party goers. You let me go, or you won't be able to tell these losers from the hamburgers that they're cooking! He yells. Miles puts up his hands. It's him that they want. If they let the people go, Miles will even give them a free shot. So the vulture agrees and fires three rounds. With a quick flip of his wrist, he shoots out webs, stopping the bullets, grabbing the vulture. The party goers cheer, but everyone is suddenly shocked when a portal opens up above their heads and leaping out of that portal comes a squad of spider people. They include Spider UK, Spider Ham, Spider Punk, Spider Gwen, Spider Woman, Spider Man Noir, and Octavia Otto. Miles Morales of Earth-616, a crisis of apocalyptic proportions is upon us, Spider-UK calls. Hey Miles, what he's trying to say is, are you busy right now? Spider-Gwen rephrases it. Miles is confused, the last time that the spider army worked together, it was to stop the threat of the inheritors. Are they back? Not yet, but someone is using their tech, Gwen confirms. Who'd be crazy enough to do that? Meanwhile, over in San Francisco, Otto Octavius is fighting another B-grade villain, Count Nefaria. The two trade blows for a few moments while trying to explain why one is smarter than the other. Finally being sick of the argument, Count Nefaria uses his laser blast to snap one of the supports on the bridge that they're fighting on. Otto doesn't waste time and using a hologram in his mechanical arms shows Nefaria a video of his family members. My Octobots are poised to kill them. Be gone or your noble lineage ends, Otto demands. Nefaria stares for a moment, and then he laughs. <laughs> I knew your turn as a hero was simply a ruse. Nefaria leaves, vowing to return when Otto returns to his old ways. Returning to his lair, Otto takes sight at his cloning technology, tech that he borrowed from the Jackal and the Inheritors when they faced off in the first Spider-Verse event. He's immortal now. I am superior, he cries out in triumph. Outside, the members of the Spider Army have arrived. While some wonder if they should knock or be worried about traps, Spider UK, who happens to be a mix of Spider-Man and Captain Britain, simply rips the hidden door off. Alarms sound as the group moves quickly through the base. Coming to the cloning tank, Spider-Man Noir prepares a grenade. You dare! 
Otto yells in the shadows with his ink shooter sticking several spiders to the wall. Otto appears angry that the members of the team that he once fought with would dare attack him. They try to explain that the inheritors are using his cloning tech to return, but his readouts show that the clones contain his DNA and no one else's. They're wrong, Miles argues. Wrong? I am Otto Octavius, I am never wrong! Spider UK doesn't have time for this, as he, Miles, and Spider Gwen leap into action. The die is cast! Otto cries, and the spiders prepare to fight. Gunfire rips out of Noir. UK destroys one of his arms, and finally Octavia Otto gets through to Otto, showing him that the inheritors were masking their DNA signatures. There is no time! Leaping forward with his twin 45s, Noir prepares to destroy the tank containing a clone, but he's suddenly stopped as a hand and rips through the glass, grabbing him by the face. Morlon has returned, and I see my breakfast awaits. The Inheritor sneers as he begins to feed. Noir doesn't hesitate. He raises those pistols, and he fires into the monster at point-blank range. But the rounds, they do nothing. Eat this! He struggles, firing again into the grenade at his belt. The explosion rips through the room, throwing everyone back. Morlon stands unaffected, his strength returning from his feeding as he throws Spider-Man Noir aside, dead. There's only one inheritor though, and Spider-UK leaps into the fight. Morlon is alone. They can defeat him. As UK is about to throw the winning punch, hands appear from the smoke. Take your hands off my brother. And with a quick jerk, UK's neck is snapped and he falls to the ground lifeless. The spiders stand ready as the second inheritor appears, but Otto is distracted and a third inheritor rips his mechanical arms off from behind. Genix prepares to sink his teeth in, but Otto isn't a totem. The Inheritors are energy vampires built to arrive and suck the life force out of the spider totems, the spider being of a universe. And Otto Octavius, well, he's merely a pretender. With a look of disappointment, Genix throws him aside, and the remaining spiders in the army now find themselves against three Inheritors. Attack! Quickly before they use the cloning tubes to resurrect more of their infernal family! Otto yells and the spiders leap into action. Biles and Mayday Parker attack Verna, webbing up her hands, but she is too strong and she smacks them away like the little insects that they are. Octavius, you're a supervillain! Haven't you got some sort of self-destruct for this place? Gwen questions. Otto is offended. I am a hero now, but yes, of course, I have a self-destruct sequence. And the rest of the spiders fight Verna while Otto and Octavia start the self-destruct sequence. But they can't just leave. They have to make sure that the inheritors are destroyed. Gwen leaps in, kicking Miles free of Verna's grasp. Go, Miles. All of you. I've got this, she orders, but they won't leave her to sacrifice herself. Gwen has a dimensional wristwatch. She'll just warp away at the last second. So as the spiders leave, webbing off the room as they go, Gwen continues to fight, keeping Verna busy while the countdown continues. But Verna is fast, snagging Gwen's arm and pulling her close, and that's what she begins to feed, sucking the life force out of Gwen's body. But Verna doesn't realize that Gwen's powers come from a symbiote now, which reacts in defense to the attack on its host. Startled, Verna pulls back as the tendrils wrap around her throat. Genix, the food is complicated. I fear that I may just have to kill it without a feast. We'll see about that, you Renfair reject. The countdown reaches 10, and the inheritors realize that they must leave. They heard Gwen's speech about her watch, and they pull one off of the dead spiders at their feet. Verna struggles trying to get Gwen's watch. You'll get this over my dead! Outside, the rest of the spiders watch the building from a distance. Come on, Gwen, get out of there, Miles whispers, and the building explodes before them. Maybe she jumped somewhere else, they, they don't know. Otto seems less sad about Gwen's potential death though, as his Octobots have also picked up the Inheritors, escaping through a dimensional portal. Almost the complete family, now wearing steampunk clothing. Verna orders the rest of the family to go find a base while she goes to find their father's spirit. The spider army, well, they're dismayed to see that she is wearing Gwen's wristwatch. What does this mean? Did Gwen survive? Mayday wants to keep fighting, but Spider-Punk knows that they need more help. Otto deduces that the Inheritors will try to rebuild the clone facilities, which gives them time. So they head to the Jackal's cloning facility at New U. They need to regroup, and opening up a dimensional portal, the team heads to Loom World, the home of the Web of Life and the Destiny. That's where they meet Karn, once a member of the Inheritor family. Karn now watches over the Web, the Web of Life, the thing that ties the multiverse together that all of the Spider-Totems are destined to protect. 
the group begins to discuss that they are going to need backup. People like Peter Parker and Jessica Drew of Earth 616 or Anya Corazon. Otto disagrees. They do need backup, but not the imbeciles that everyone has mentioned. They need spiders that will not hesitate to put down the inheritors once and for all. He suggested this last time, but everyone disagreed. The room quickly becomes divided. Spider Punk and Octavia side with Otto. They need spider individuals who are willing to kill, while Mayday Miles and Spider Ham are against killing. They will go find individuals who are on their side. Karn puts an end to the fighting, suggesting that both groups pursue their own paths, and destiny will decide who is right. In agreement, the spiders separate, traveling through the portals to find allies. Fare thee well, my friends. It has been an honor. Karn whispers to the empty room. Or is it empty? Ah, brother. A voice hisses from the shadows behind him. Verna steps out, mocking her brother for becoming the Master Weaver. It has made him soft. Killing you will be a mercy. I should have done it a millennia ago. She smiles. I could say the same, dear sister. To death, then. Back on Earth 616, Otto, Octavia, and Spider Punk have arrived at Otto's labs in Horizon University. Spider Punk doesn't want to waste time and he portals away to find allies. Realizing this is a war for the spiders, Otto changes from his superior octopus costume. He is once again the superior Spider Man! The die is cast, he calls. I've always wanted to say that, but I thought people would find it silly, Octavia states. While the other spiders are searching for allies or helping those they've already met, Otto begins to search the multiverse for those who might share his ideals for putting an end to the Inheritors once and for all. Before traveling through the multiverse, though, Otto knows a few people on this Earth who might help them. First, he travels to Las Vegas, reaching out to Kane, the former Scarlet Spider. Kane agrees, but when Otto asks if he has any issues with killing individuals, buddy, I'll enjoy it, he hisses. As they portal away, Ben Riley, the new Scarlet Spider, slips into the portal behind them. Back on Loom World, Karn does battle with Verna, blades from one of his steampunk spider limbs piercing her chest, and he brings her in close, too close. By becoming the keeper of the web of life and destiny, Karn has become a spider totem. Verna drinks his life force, killing him. Now nothing stands in the Inheritor's way. And back on Earth 3109, Spider Gwen awakens. Where am I? She questions, suddenly realizing that her dimensional wristwatch is gone. Later, Otto has enlisted the aid of the Spider-Man of Earth 1048, and the two of them arrived at Earth 51778 to look for one of the most powerful allies. The new Spider-Man is a little new to traveling the multiverse, and he's stunned when he sees the robot Lopardin fighting against a massive kaiju. You know what? I think you should take the lead on this, he quips. Teleporting into Lopardin, Otto gives to Kuya, the Spider-Man of Earth 51778, some advice on how to defeat the creature. Lead with the sword, he tells him. Takuya recognizes Otto from the last war with the Inheritors. PS4 Spider-Man waves in greeting. Lead with Sword Vigor? That would be so dishonorable! Sword Vigor is so powerful. Takuya wonders. That's the point. Otto explains that he can destroy his enemies much faster that way. Takuya agrees, launching Sword Vigor, destroying the creature in one blow. While Takuya agrees that it works. If I always fought this way, it'd become boring. Back on Earth 50101, Miles is in Mumbai recruiting the aid of the Spider-Man of India, Pavater. The two stop some robbers while Miles explains the current situation and how they need the smartest spiders to help. With the crime stopped, they teleport away. And they arrive at their base of operations where they're greeted by their comrades. The team that doesn't want to kill has now recruited Spider-Man and Spinnerette of 18119, Spider-Ben and Petey of Earth 91918, and Spider from Earth 14512, and Silk from Earth 616. Everyone believes that they need Peter Parker of Earth 616, but he's busy distracting more Lun right now, so they'll have to deal with the other Inheritors themselves. It's not just the Inheritors that we have to worry about. It's also Doc Ock and his band of trigger-happy goons, Spider-Ham points out. Miles believes that they should ask them for help with their attack, but not everyone agrees. The spider forces are spreading thin, with Mayday, Annie, and Anya looking for information about the spider totems. The older Peter Parker from Earth 18119, the Renew Your Vows universe, agrees that they could use the help. Otto has set up their base on Lepardon in Earth 616, and they have now been joined by the Spiders Man, the Spider Man who's made up of a thousand spiders, the Cowboy Spider Man of Earth 31913 named Web Slinger, and Norman Osborne Spider Man of Earth 44145. 
Otto's forces are also spread thin as he has a strike team led by Kane, trying to stop Verna from retrieving the crystal with her father's essence in it. They are surprised by the arrival of Ben Riley, former villain known as Jackal and the new Scarlet Spider. Otto doesn't trust this man as he was the villain at the heart of the clone conspiracy, but Riley informs him that he's just trying to help. Since the Inheritors are trying to use his cloning tech, they might need him. I think you of all people would appreciate the guy with the checkered past trying to make amends, Ben states, pulling off the mask to show his scarred face. Very well, but my gaze shall be upon you, Otto states in a strange former villain fashion. A transmission from Miles' team goes through, and young Petey informs Otto that they are making a strike against the Inheritors at the new U cloning facility. Some of the team want to help, yet Otto believes that if they waste their time and lives on a suicide mission for the other team, it's up to them. At the Inheritor's base, the body of the Inheritor's father has been completed. Yet he isn't whole. The body is a completely soulless husk. Unknown to the Inheritors, Spider-Ham has infiltrated the events above them. Breaker, breaker, bacon buddy to head honcho. Recon successful, we're in time. He calls over his radio as he returns to the team. Miles and the rest of the team are waiting. Having placed bombs on all of the support beams, they are simply going to blow this place up and escape. Eliminating the Inheritors cloning abilities in its entirety, preventing them from moving bodies or coming back to life. Everyone back through the portal, I'll go last. I've got to hit the detonator right as I'm leaping through, Miles orders. Suddenly a knife whips out of the shadows by the inheritor known as Bora. The blade slashes across Miles' wrist, forcing him to drop the detonator. The inheritors are now among them, with the spiders fighting to survive. With a slash from inheritor Brix's whip, the detonator is destroyed. He doesn't hesitate and he grabs Miles, beginning to feed off of his life force. Spider, detonate the charges from your suit, Miles orders as he struggles against the vampire. I'll be killing us all, she yells. The others don't know what they're doing. There's no choice. Penny Parker begins to count down. The wall explodes from behind them as the giant tip of sword vigor slices through. Otto's team comes in web slinging with web slinger on a horse. The new team locks into a battle with the inheritors. They deactivated our bombs. We can't leave their equipment intact. Miles tells spider punk. Relax, we got people on that. Deeper in the facility, Otto and his group have used the battle as a distraction. Scarlet Spider begins to destroy the equipment so that it can't be used, while Otto scans the body of Solus, the Inheritor's father, for weaknesses. That's when they're interrupted by Bricks and Bora, who charge at them throwing knives, but instead of fighting, the team retreats with everyone heading into Leparted. With everyone aboard, Leparted begins to transform into the ship Marvelar. This is certainly the strangest spider that we have faced. Bricks quips, trying to get into the mech. And as they get away, everyone seems safe. But Spider Osborne uses his time to quietly speak with Spider's man about their own plan to trap the inheritors on 616. In a quiet lab, a portal opens, and Jessica Drew emerges, still clad in her anti-radiation suit. She seems disoriented. In her hands, she holds the soulless crystal, a stone that traps the essence of the Inheritor's father. A clawed hand moves fast, snatching the stone from her, lifting her by the throat. Our dear sister Verna has sent us a gift, Genix snarls, his fangs displayed in a grin. Jessica tries to struggle, but she is thrown away. When Deimos quickly tries to feed off of her, though, he is weakened. Jessica received her powers from a radiation blast, and radiation poisons the inheritors. This is good news for Genix, though. They can study her DNA and learn how to eliminate the weakness to radiation that they inherently have. Yet, there is time for that later. With a smile of triumph, Jetix places the crystal into the machine with Solus's body. A growl issues from their father's throat as Solus finally awakens. I live! I live! He cries, maniacal laughter filling the room. His children all bow before him. But back with our heroes, the spiders have taken up a field trip in Earth-13. The place where the spider army first fought the Inheritors looks like a battlefield. And erected there is a statue of this world's Spider-Man. A spider that had combined with the powers of Captain Universe. Yet this still was not enough, and he fell to Solus. Otto Octavius has brought everyone here so that they may analyze the powers cosmic, so that he may find it in their own universe. Spider Norman believes that this is a waste of time, and some of the team begins to bicker about their next course of action. A portal opens up, and Spider Punk pops his head out, interrupting the conversations. Guys, we really gotta get back to the base. I got some bad news. Back at Lepardon, the giant robot mech Spider-Man, Octavia gives the team the bad news. 
Solus has awakened. Spider Norman doesn't believe that it matters. They need to stop putting their hopes on things like Captain Universe and come up with a plan. That is enough. Otto states, Otto, who is also known as Superior Spider-Man, has changed his mind and the team does not require the help of Norman Osborn anymore. The rest of the spiders agree, regardless of whether they agree with Otto on the way to stop the inheritors. And the room stands against Norman. I'll just go back to my world and work on a real solution. Osborn states, opening up a portal. He offers Spider's man a chance to join him. And the creepy hero that is actually made up of millions of little spiders that believe themselves to be Peter Parker accepts. The web watch, Osborne. I will not have you gallivanting across dimensions causing trouble. Otto orders, and Norman Osborne tosses back the device. Wouldn't dream of it. Have fun storming the castle, idiots. And with this insult, Norman is gone. The team goes back to their planning, with Otto believing that they have all the brute strength, the Lepardon, and sword vigor, the weapon of Lepardon. Miles doesn't think so, though, and he wants to bring in more spider individuals, more allies. The two compromise. Otto will come up with a plan. The unneeded spiders will gather more allies. But Norman and Spider's man, they did not go home. They have arrived on Loom World. Norman once saw it through a cosmic cube, and all they find is the body of Karn, the former inheritor and the former Loom Weaver. Spider's man sends out some of his little spiders making a meal of Karn, and Norman ignores him, slicing off a piece of the web of life and destiny. With the web of life and destiny, I can go anywhere. But with all of these web watches out there, someone will stomp us. Reaching into another dimension, Norman Osborn pulls forth a can of radioactive material. But what if the web of life did not exist? Back on the pardon, Miles is running down a list of new potential spider individuals to join their battle against the Inheritors. One is a giant red T-Rex, and one is a grizzled cop with a mustache. A spider cop. Spider cop exists? I can't express how happy this makes me. PS4 Spider-Man whispers. Suddenly, everyone's web watches short circuit and deactivate. Moments earlier on Loom World, Spider's man has separated himself and gone into different dimensions. Norman, too, steps through a portal, and at the last second, he presses a switch on his detonator, destroying the web of life behind him. Back on the part of the spiders realize that they are now trapped, and without their web watches, they can't see into the other worlds. They can't travel. Some have children that they've left behind. Someone trapped the inheritors on World 616 with them. Miles tries to calm everyone down. We're gonna get through this, together guys. Otto, he says turning, but the superior Spider-Man has disappeared and Scarlet Spider, Ben Riley, with him. Otto and Ben have arrived in the lair of the Inheritors, slipping quietly inside with Otto wanting to make sure one more time that Riley will not betray him. Don't worry, I'll do my part, Riley states as he turns away from Otto. Then so will I! Otto declares with one of his mechanical spider arms slicing down on Riley's back, knocking him unconscious. He picks him up and he moves forward. I have fulfilled my bargain. Show yourselves, inheritors. His enemy stands before him, and Otto Octavius offers Ben Riley as a sacrifice. I must admit, we were intrigued by your offer, Genix smiles, taking Riley. Once he absorbs the life force, he will know all he needs to know about this universe's cloning equipment. Otto cares nothing for the inheritors, just hold up their end of the bargain and spare 616. I agree to your terms. We will show this world mercy. Though they made no promises as to those that would interfere with their work. Otto turns away as the vampires descend upon Scarlet Spider. Back upon the pardon, Miles has sent a message out to the Enigma Force, the power of Captain Universe, and they have gotten a response. Who dares summon Enigma Force? It bellows across the room. The Enigma Force is not a tool to be manipulated by mortals. The Enigma Force comes to those it deems worthy. What arrogance makes you think that you are worthy? The energy seems to have washed over the room, and one by one the spiders realize their failures in life. And it is finally Miles who speaks up. Now, you know what? Maybe we're not worthy. None of us. But who is? Miles yells at the mysterious cosmic power. We're trying to save the multiverse, and if that's not good enough, then go away! The energy flares, filling the room with red light. Ah, Miles, perhaps we should not antagonize the cosmic force. The Indian Spider-Man observes. Back at the Inheritor's base, Otto begins to leave before the monster's feet. I can't believe you did this, Otto! A voice hisses from the rafters. Otto turns, and he tells him, Silence! They'll hear you! PS4 Spider-Man followed him and he leaps to attack their betrayer. A quick web bomb sticks Otto to the wall and PS4 turns as he senses the Scarlet Spider in danger. Ben Riley's vision begins to blur as he wakes up, his eyes 
focusing and he stares into the face of a monster. Genix begins to feed on his life force, gaining his knowledge as well. Yet knowledge is not all that Ben Riley has locked away in his mind. Memories of his 27 deaths and resurrections at the hands of the Jackal, causing the shattering of his mind, which is also passed to Genix. I'm dying! Again and again, I'm dying! Genix screams as insanity overtakes his mind. PS4 then realizes Otto's plan, but before the two of them can make up and, you know, get along, the inheritors are upon them. Solus's sheer strength forces them back. Trying to gain the upper hand, the two are knocked into one another. They are no match for the inheritors, and Solus stands over them. I claim this kill. From behind, he is hit with a powerful cosmic blast, though. Turning, they see the spiders led by Miles Morales, now with the power of Captain Universe. Solus and Cosmic Miles lock into combat, with Solus trying to get close with his brute strength, but Miles plays it smart, he keeps him at a distance. Even with all of his powers, Solus seems to be shrugging off each blast. Outside, Lepardon is flying in to join the fight. The windshield shatters inward as Deimos leaps through. He stands over to Koya. I told you that I'd feast upon your meat. Lepardon is dangerous, so Deimos will stop him now. You think Lepardon is the one to fear? I am an emissary of hell. Face me, villain, and learn what that means, Sequoia yells. In the distance, Spider watches as Lepardon crashes out of the sky. Leaping to her teammate's aid, Penny Parker finds Deimos struggling from the wreckage. Back inside, the spiders have met the inheritors in battle, and taking this moment, Otto grabs Octavia and the two of them slip away. Otto has a plan, and Octavia finds one of their allies, freeing Jessica Drew. The battle rages on even now in that direction, but we have a different mission, Otto states, and without hesitation, Jessica runs off to join the fight. Otto's plan is simple, to right a wrong. The spiders are losing. With Cosmic Miles fighting Solus, the rest do not have the strength to defeat the inheritors. Older Peter Parker and Spinneret MJ from the Renew Your Vows universe share one last kiss, hoping that their daughter, Annie Mae, will be all right. But that's at the exact moment that we hear. Mom, Dad, we talked about being gross in public. Annie Mae, their daughter of Earth 18119, yells as she comes through a portal with Mayday and Spider Girl. It turns out that the three young spider women are actually the pattern makers. And they move straight out of the power Rangers, the three women suddenly power up wearing spider armor from the web of life and destiny. With this added strength, the battle continues, and the spiders now stand a chance. The battle rages on, spider against energy vampire. With Mede attacking Deimos, her heart set on the revenge of the death of her father in the previous war. The Spider-Verse! Bricks and Bora are bleeding, with Jenix fighting a mad rage, his mind now broken. Still, it might not be enough. Miles continues his fight with Solus, trying to stay ahead of the monster. Suddenly, another portal opens, and more spiders emerge, led by Spider-Gwen and Peter Parker, from Earth 616. Seeing his friend, Miles renews his assault, combining his Venom Strike with the Power Cosmic and throwing Solus across the room. Peter 616 wants to help, but he doesn't have the strength to take down Solus. He has been beaten down by Morlun, and if you're interested in that story, we put that video out two weeks ago. Swinging away, he goes to find Otto, who now stands with the resurrected Ben Riley. We have to kill the Inheritors. You can persuade the others, Otto states, but Peter will never condone killing. And that's when Otto reveals the plan to him. Okay, this sounds actually interesting, Otto. Using their comms, Peter orders the rest of the spiders to follow Otto's lead. Suddenly, behind Solus, they stand. Hey, Solus, I'm back and I got two words for you. Miles quips, Sword Vigor! He yells, throwing a massive mecha blade, piercing Solus and throwing him into the wall. You're supposed to cross your arms when you say it. Takoya informs him. Notes later, please. The rest of the inheritors leap to the defense of their father, but the rest of the spiders quickly pile onto them, webbing them down, holding them for a time. Later, Otto's plan has worked. Long ago, the inheritors were mutated and turned into monsters by their father. Otto has now transferred their consciousness into clone babies. Without the memories of their past and no father to change them into monsters, they have been given a second chance at life. Now they just need someone to adopt them. Luckily, among the crowd is a friendly elderly woman who goes by the name of Spider-Ma'am. She thinks that her husband and nephew will love to have the children. With the crisis over, the Enigma Force leaves Miles' body, flying off to wherever it comes from. The rest of the spiders return to their worlds. Despite their differences, Miles and Otto have at least come to an agreement. If he ever needs help, Miles will be there for the superior Spider-Man. Meanwhile, somewhere in a dark lab, Spider-Norman stares at a piece of the web of life and destiny that he took. He smiles.
It was just another day of crime fighting as Spider-Man Miles Morales takes down the villain 8-Ball with none other than a mop cue stick. As he knocks the crook down, he yells, Corner Pocket! Get it? Because you're 8-Ball. An 8-Ball sighs, telling him that this is getting to be too much. He's going to move to Houston. But as Miles finishes webbing 8-Ball up, he hears a female voice calling out to him and his spider sense begins to go crazy. He gets away from the villain asking what's going on. He stopped the bad guy, so what is this? The voice calls out again, and Miles shouts, Who are you? How are you yelling in my head? It's Spider Zero. I'm nanocasting through the arachno frequency to lock your ultra spatial coordinates down. Get ready. Before Miles has a chance to react, an ethereal web line shoots onto his back, pulling him back through the portal. Spider Zero tells him, It's okay. You're being web extracted across the multiverse at 130 brands per second. I have you on a super string tether, skating the upright edges of the parallel planes of reality. The web is life! The web is destiny! Just hold on a bit longer, Spider-Man! Miles falls out into Earth 18201-3525, Manhattan 2.0, and a group of spider-themed teens swing by, one of them grabbing Miles from falling, telling him, You should mask up. You want to get pinched by the Iron Man? Miles is confused, asking who, as he looks around and he sees the Goblin Club up ahead. But Spider-Zero calls out to his mind again. You're in the wrong place. Where are you? Miles jumps onto one of the Goblin Thugs. I'm, I'm not sure. I might be in a gang war. And Spider-Zero tells him, hang tight. I'm going to pull you through again. The web lashes inwards, chucking Miles across the multiverse into Earth 1411319 into the heart of Monster Hatton. Miles looks around at all of the monsters, and they scream at him, which in turn makes him scream back at them. As he's trying to figure out what's going on, a voice tells him, There's only one spider here, Spider Monster! But as Spider Monster is about to get over to Miles, he's ripped through the portal and back onto Earth 10113519, smack dab in the middle of the Queen's Crater. But as Miles looks around, he realizes that he is now on top of the speeding spider buggy, being driven by a man in a Spider-Man ask, and, well, nothing else. Climb aboard humanity's last ride, little spider. Miles stumbles into the passenger seat, asking, What do you mean, humanity's last ride? We're protecting the canister. After the war, this was the last sample of non-irradiated human DNA. The mutants will stop at nothing to end the human race forever. That is why I, Lord Spider, must protect humanity's only chance of survival. Miles looks back to realize they're being chased by mutated mutants, formerly known as the X-Men. Ah, you're still in the wrong place. Don't worry, I'm going to fix it. Miles tries to tell her to wait, telling her that he has to help Lord Spider. And just like that, he's thwipped out of existence again, finally landing in the colorless world of Earth 51778, home of Spider-Man Takuya. Brother and spiders! Your hot blood has sustained you in your journey. Only the fire of youth could survive such an adventure. Come, have some Suyu Kimino. Miles grabs Takuya, asking, What is going on? Who is Spider Zero? Spider Zero! Takuya yells dramatically and then begins to sing karaoke. Spider Zero, the nomad spider with no world to call home. Spider Zero, the one in the center charged with observing the web and protecting it. Are you Spider Zero? Actually, I am Spider-Zero. A kid walks into the room and Miles asks, Wait, you're a kid. I'm even older than you. Right, and I need your help. We have to save the web. Right, wasn't the web of life or destiny destroyed, like blown up during the Spider-Geddon? Miles and Spider-Zero disappear in a dramatic fashion as Akuya continues to dance and sing like everything that just happened is normal. Moments later, an Earth, 001, formerly Loom World, where the Inheritors live, formerly the Hall of Spiders. Miles looks at the web of life and destiny, stating, Oh yeah, it is back. Spider-Zero tells him that there must always be a web of life and destiny, and when it was destroyed, the Pattern Maker wove it anew. Pattern Maker? You mean Annie Mae Parker, right, Spiderling? Yeah, Annie Mae was selected to make the web, just as she was selected to be at the center of it and watch and take care of it. And what's more, the web is sick, corrupted. No matter how much I cut away, it continues to spread. We have to heal the web and find Annie Mae. Miles looks at her. Why don't you get the real Spider-Man? Like, why not Peter Parker? Because we're the new generation. You, me, and Annie Mae. There were others before us, but these are our jobs now. We're new, and this web is new. It all fits. We're the ones who have to do this. Yeah, okay, you got me. Let's get all the crazy kids together and save the universe. 
Where do we even start? Spider Zero looks at the web. We start everywhere. The first world that Miles has to visit is the world of spectacular Spider-Man. A world where Peter Parker wasn't the one bit by the radioactive spider, but actually Aunt May. In this world, Peter is helping Aunt May by building and designing her gadgets, making sure that she is always one step ahead. One day, Peter came to a shocking realization. They all know that they live in the multiverse, but how many other universes are there? What if there are evil versions of themselves waiting to strike, waiting for the perfect moment, which coincidentally enough is this exact moment, dear readers. Just then a portal rips open and an evil Peter and Uncle Ben step out, led by Carnage May. Carnage May yells out, We are here to prove that nothing really matters in the multiverse. Get ready to die, Spider-Man. As the evil doppelgangers begin to take over the heroes, Miles pops out of an alleyway, punching Carnage May, telling her, Thanks for making it easy to decide which one of you is the good one. Miles and Spider-Man knock Carnage May out, webbing her up. And as Miles begins to explain what is going on, she explains to him that there's no need to explain. She knows exactly what's going on, and it's very good to see you again. Spider-Man begins to ask about the Carnage May, explaining that her costume is so powerful. So Miles explains what a symbiote is. And to demonstrate the weakness of the symbiotes, he charges up his Venom Bite, shocking her, transferring the heat of the shock with Carnage May screaming in pain, falling over. Spider-Man asks if there are other spider people like him, but he tells her, no, I'm an original. Just then a voice says, you know, that's funny. I was about to say the same thing. And evil Miles leaps through the portal, shocking both Miles and Spider-Man, quickly freeing Carnage May. Carnage May says that it's about time he showed up with evil Miles telling her, you think I'd miss all the fun? Not in a million years. The evil versions begin to make their way towards Peter and Uncle Ben, but Miles whispers that he's still in the game. That shock doesn't affect his suit like the evil him thinks. The brawl begins to start again with Spider-Man asking Peter what could they do. Clearly they can't win with sheer strength. So Uncle Ben comes up with the idea of sending them back to their world, so Peter figures out an idea that will help that happen. How he can make an interdimensional portal. Peter's idea is that the parallel universes are all overlaid in the same three space dimensional location. But that would mean that it's possible that the exact spot of impact can coexist across the multiple realities and it could open and close an interdimensional tear. The only problem is they're going to need trillions of parallel spider mams and other timelines shooting webs in the exact spot. And there's no way to tell them that. So spider man smiles and says, never say never, Miles, the logo. Miles webs the exact spot that Spider-Man does, and right at that exact moment, all of the Spider-Mans across the multiverse do the exact same thing, all of them hitting the logo. The portal tears open, with Peter wondering how this is even possible. So she told him it was easy. Instead of choosing randomly, she decided to aim for the one spot that would remind her of him and Ben, because she believes that there is really only one constant across all of the universe, and that would be love. Hence the sign with the heart on it. The evil doppelgangers all begin to get sucked into their interdimensional universes, but it doesn't appear to be enough, and Peter tells Spider-Man that the alternates need to join them as well. All of the alternate Peters and Bens join in, and the portal's strength grows, pulling all of the evil versions of themselves into it. As it closes, everyone falls to the ground safe. And with this world saved, Spider-Zero pulls Miles back out to move on to the next world that needs saving, leaving this spectacular Spider-Man to keep a close eye on this one. But as everyone leaves and everything seems to be over, the Peter of Spider-Man's world hears a scratching sound in his room, one that would appear to be a piece of carnage that was left behind. Miles quickly touches down in the next world, with him and Penny Parker, the girl that runs the spider mech suit, running along the rooftops, with Uncle Ben radioing in that they need to hurry. Heart rate is dropping fast. Miles and Penny are then hit with a blast, and Penny quickly grabs Miles by the legs to stop him from falling, with Miles asking, Who's throwing bombs at us? Do you have a green goblin in this world? Penny asks, What's that? And Ben tells her that she needs to fall back. They need to figure out what they're up against. But Penny tells him, no, she has to get there or Daredevil's going to die. The voice then appears again over the comms telling Ben, she's very brave. You must be very proud. Ben realizes what is going on, that this is a trap, that Daredevil is being used as bait. Miles and Penny are then hit again. They begin to wonder where this blast is coming from, with a voice telling them that once he died, he was reborn. It was his thoughts that brought him back from the frozen vaults of death, back to the hunt. Miles' spider sense begins to go off as a distorted figure moves, but he tries to get ahead of it, with Penny taking the direct hit, forcing the spider suit to reboot. 
Penny shouts in frustration, telling Miles to go on ahead and get to Daredevil. He needs to save him. She can't do anything until her suit is back to 100%. And the distorted man says, yes, you are of no use to me, only the spider. As the man appears, Ben says that it looks like it's Craven. And Miles tells Ben, cool, we got a Craven on my world too. This is gonna be dope. So Miles webs up Craven's arms, charging and punching him to the ground. Ben watches as Miles fights Craven back, telling him, you're supposed to be dead. How is this possible? It is mysterious. And you never would have lost anyone to the Sin Engine, but Spider was always the prize project according to the powers that be. Ben quickly realizes what has revived Craven. What is causing these problems? What set Daredevil up as a bait? Red Diamond. Back out in the city, the spider suit reaches 100%, and Penny yells out, finally! And she shoots a concentrated web blast at Craven. But Craven dodges it. You can't win, because the city doesn't love you. Penny tells Miles to take the med kit, save Daredevil. Craven wants her. Back at the lab, Ben begins to go over the file, stating, I know that technology. Weapon 6, Nathan Essex. He's supposed to be dead as well. The fire at the Weapon 6 facility. And Nathan comes back over the comms. Even though Weapon 6 burned, it did not die. It turns out there are other sources of funding that one can attain if one makes the right kind of moves. When the government got involved in your spider project, my funding dried up. You stole my future, Ben Parker. Ben begins to sweat, realizing that Nathan has been creating enhanced criminals, such as Craven, the diamond implants, weaponizing those people as deniable assets. You're insane, Nathan. When someone takes something from me, I become angry, and I'm going to take revenge, even if it takes years to plan. But out in the city, Penny continues to fight against Craven, stating, you know I can hear you, right? How about you both just shut up and watch me win this? Penny is struck again, knocking the suit's power off, but Craven begins to walk towards her, telling her, are you still alive in there? She takes a deep breath, opening up the hatch, standing on the shoulders of the spider suit. Ben asks, what is she doing? Craven's going to kill her, and she hops down. Yeah, I'm a kid, and you don't hurt kids, right, Craven? Right? At that moment, Miles jumps down from behind, giving Craven a venom blast so powerful that it knocks him out. She turns to Miles. Great, but where's Daredevil? Daredevil slowly walks in, stating that he still needs to go to the hospital, but he'll live for now. That was quite the risk that she took. Penny smiles, telling him, yeah. She explains that Craven was after her father, and that is who he wanted to hunt. So she used herself as a bait, since so she had her own invisible hunter. Miles. Nathan radios to Ben asking, do you think you've won? I will send more Weapon 6 enhanced criminals after you and her. And Ben pulls out the radio from his ear, telling Control to shut down the channel. Full security work up on this breach. Block Nathan and figure out where he is. Ben then takes a picture out of his coat of his wife and Penny Parker asks, what are you doing? But Miles is continuing his adventure. He continues to go through the multiverse to save the other spider individuals, to save the web of destiny. And his next stop is Earth 31913, the home of a man that folks call the Web Slinger, the cowboy Spider-Man who fires webs from six shooters. As the train comes chugging along the tracks, Web Slinger flings himself atop the train cars as a group of bandits begin to rob the train. He lands asking the men if they've got their tickets and one man yells, this don't concern you, Web Slinger. Yeah, reckon they didn't sell tickets to ride the roof anyhow. The leader tells everyone to jump shot, but Web Slinger smacks the hammer on his guns, webbing everyone's arms to their holsters. The bandit leader jumps to the front of the train, grabbing the engineer, stating, if you make one false move, partner, the engineer gets it. Web Slinger tells him, I could either use the kisser, that's the one on my left hand, or biter, the one on my right. Biter scars though. The leader throws the engineer at Web Slinger, kicking the lever to Max as he jumps out the window. Adios, Web Slinger! The train begins to pick up speed as it goes barreling towards a stack of dynamite placed on the track. So Web Slinger grabs the engineer, tossing him out. This is for your own good! With one quick pull of the trigger, Web Slinger webs the engineer to a trigger. Web Slinger then jumps out, pulling the trigger, realizing he's out of webs. As he falls into the river below, he pulls himself onto his shore when he sees Miles in a sombrero and poncho. There you are! Remember me, Webslinger? Webslinger shakes the water out of his hat. Of course, you're the fella that zapped me into the future to fight some sucker dandies. What brings you back? I'm here to help. Thanks, but no thanks. You stick out like a bison in a ball gown. Folks don't take kindly to your kind. 
Miles then tells Webslinger, uh, first, I would like to introduce you to political correctness. And regardless if you want it or not, I'm here until the next jump. Webslinger whistles to call his horse, and as the horse turns the corner, it bolts in his direction. Miles asks how the horse is so fast, and Webslinger explains that him and Widow get bit by the same bug, and ever since they've been able to talk to each other without talking. He calls it Rider Sense. Miles looks at the horse asking what the point of the mask is, and Webslinger says so the folks don't recognize him. The two sit by a campfire later that night, getting ready to turn in for the night, when suddenly they hear a snapping of a twig. Webslinger grabs his guns, yelling to the intruder to show their hands, but a young girl stumbles out of the bushes, yelling in Spanish. Sorry there, I don't speak. But Miles begins to talk to her. She explains to Miles, and he relays it to Webslinger, that there's a small village in Mexico with a group of bandits that are taking all of the food and money, and when they can't pay, they take the women. We're gonna help her, right, Webslinger? So Miles continues to translate, and it turns out that a villain known as El Scorpion, or The Scorpion, is the one in charge of it all. Miles and Webslinger begin to make their way towards the village, and as they get over there, they hear the scorpion yelling out, Rapido, amigos! El uno, una pelea! Webslinger spins back, slapping Widow, telling them to go on again. Miles tries to state that he can stay and help, but Widow speeds off before he has a chance to finish his sentence. Once clear, Webslinger fires a web line into a nearby cactus and a rock, creating a trip line, knocking everyone off of their horses. Webslinger then jumps onto one of the horses, with Scorpion getting to his feet to chase after. One of the bandits turns back, yelling in Spanish again, and Miles thinks to himself the translation. Did they just call me the Black Ghost? I kinda don't hate that. Webslinger and Scorpion go back and forth for a few moments, with Scorpion explaining that these pathetic peasants are lucky that he even allows them to live, but instead, they bring a Webslinger, and they will pay dearly for that. Scorpion goes on explaining that he is the world's deadliest scorpion, with Deathstalker venom coursing through his veins and going into Webslinger right now, and as Webslinger begins to laugh, he tells him that it tingles. Scorpion's confused, thinking that it's his venom, but Webslinger informs him it's my rider sense. Suddenly, the widow kicks him in the back of the head. And with that, Webslinger sits back up, now with Scorpion defeated because his horse kicked him in the head. Miles runs up, sucking the poison out, spitting it on the ground. Please don't book me, White Mao. And Webslinger tips his head. I should probably tell you my name. My name is Patrick. Patrick O'Hara. But as Webslinger looks back after revealing his identity, Miles is gone because he was whipped out into another universe. The fourth world that Miles visits to correct all of these multiversal Spider-Man issues is the home of Spider-Man Noir. On this Earth, it's 1933, and Peter Parker has become a private eye, keeping the street clear of any wrongdoers. And some would say in another version of this, he's voiced by Nicolas Cage in a movie. However, for this Noir, he died when helping out the other Spider-Folks. He figured that it would be the end of the line, but somewhere in the blackness, he heard a voice. One that he heard before, and it told him that he cannot rest. His service has not yet ended. This was the Spider God, the one that bestows its powers on Spider-Man Noir, and it wouldn't let him sleep. And that explains why I'm here. But why the hell are you here, Miles? Also, next time, try using my door. Maybe where you come from, nobody cares, but here. Miles jumps into the window, telling him that it's the web of life and destiny. It's been blown up. And Ani Mae Parker is spinning a new one, but she also disappeared. Now the new one is sick. And he's looking for Annie Mae, but also stuff that can help the web heal. That's when I remember something about this place. You have an idol, a spider god. Something like that has to be a powerful spider totem, right? Maybe we could use it to stabilize the web. Is your spider god around? Noir tells him, last time I checked, the goblin had it. But he doesn't have it anymore. Or anything else. How about we go out and turn some rocks and see what crawls out? Hopefully the idol isn't with someone worse than Norman Osborn. Elsewhere, a woman hooks the spider idol to a machine, stating that this is fascinating. Even damaged, her instruments are clearly reading the power within the primitive relic. Once, this was worshipped by subhuman fools who would do anything to serve the spider god, but today it will serve her and the like! Back at the Black Cat Club, Ox and Montana live it up, telling everyone that they got everyone covered for the night, so long as they're ladies. Noir hangs down. Now that is downright discriminatory. Ox jumps up, swinging his chair, shouting, You're the one who cost me everything! And Noir asks, Really? Looks like you're doing fine. Montana cracks his whip to grab Miles, but Miles asks, Do you really want to do that? All right. Miles sends a shock back through its stunning Montana. Noir then grabs Ox, telling him, We came here to talk about the spider idol. Just tell us where it is, or we can skip the electrical chair and you can ride the lightning, courtesy of my partner's venom blast. 
Ox yells, wait, 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 I'll talk. We're having problems selling the damn thing. Then this woman Strum showed up. From what I heard, it was for Adolf Hitler himself. As the two leave, Miles says that he knows that they were just getting information, but he isn't so keen on threatening to kill people. Around here, life has a way of tossing you a lot of things you're not comfortable with. Case in point, I'm not too partial to Nazi blimps flying over Manhattan, but here we are, Miles. Miles looks up to say that when Ox said cargo ship, this is not what he had in mind. The two men enter a building after calling out to Strum, and they find a box full of bees hooked up to Spider Idol. She goes on to explain that the true power of such things lies in merging them with science, combining the totemic energies of the spider idol with her preferred insect, bees. And after this, she will become a god, a god of the bees. <laughs> the bees swarm around her and the men take the idol out of the machine with Miles and Noir jumping and webbing them all up. Noir says that he can see why the idol brought him back. It didn't want to work for Hitler. Even ancient spider gods have standards. The only thing I don't get is what's with the glass tube full of. But before he could finish, the glass shatters and Strum floats out in her new bee form. Miles realizes what is going on. I knew it! You want a Nazi made out of bees? That's how you get a Nazi made out of bees! Strum informs him that she will now refer to her as her new name, Madame Swans! Noir webs up the room, telling Miles that they gotta get out of here, and Miles tells them that they do need to get outside. But as the two get out, Madame Swarm yells, You fools! I have thousand more bees outside! Soon Madame Swarm's body grows in size with all of these bees, and Noir tells him that he has an idea. He read at a Life magazine that those blips are full of hydrogen, and Miles tells him he can see where this is going. Noir swings it back around, calling out to Miles that he has now cleared out the blimp, and Miles yells for him to get out of the way. He sends a venom blast into the blimp, blowing it up from the inside, burning away all of Madame Swarm's bees. The two then create a giant web blanket to catch the wreckage, with Miles stating, Oh, the bee manatee! I only understand half of anything you ever say, Miles. As everything is cleared, Noir tosses Miles the idol, and Miles asks, What happened if you die again? Don't you need this? If you get killed again, that's it. That's how it works for everyone else. I don't get special treatment. Sure as hell don't deserve it. Take it. Do what you gotta do. I'll manage just fine with my fists and my 45s. Miles asks him, Okay, Noir, you always sound so cool. Do you practice? And at that moment, before we can get an answer, Miles is pulled away, disappearing. And Noir answers, Yeah, I practice. With great power, there must also come great responsibility. But that don't mean you can't have a touch of class. Now, instead of going to another world, though, Spider Zero brings Miles back to the world that started it all, Loom World. I did it! I found you! I also brought some help from the other spider people. Spider Zero looks at the idol that Miles brought and tells him that her spider sense couldn't find Annie Mae because Annie Mae isn't on any world. This idol will act as a sort of antenna, a signal booster from the Great Weaver. It will let me feel Annie Mae where she is. And I found her in the web itself. She's trapped in the tangle. Everyone jumps onto the tangled web ball and Spider Zero yells, wait, I can feel pain, pain everywhere. She falls to her knees. The tangle, it's alive. The web's power knotted and snarled. It's running back over itself over and over again, creating primitive consciousness. It's in pain, it's in pain and it doesn't understand why, but it feels, it feels pain, it feels us. It wants us gone. Everyone's spider sense goes off as dozens of portals rip open and monsters begin to pour out. Those portals are from Earth 51778. It brought monsters from the monster Earth to stop us from getting to Annie Mae. Miles asks, what are they? And Spider Zero explains that it is the Iron Cross army made to destroy Spider-Man. But everyone charges in as Miles answers with, this many spider folk? They're welcome to try. Get them, spiders! Lord Spider jumps in, punching one of the monsters. For the future! Everyone engages the monsters with Spider Zero telling Miles that they need to get inside the tangle. If they don't save Annie Mae, it will get worse. So with everyone battling the monsters, Miles realizes that they need him. So they're going to need more spider people to save the day. At that moment, another portal opens up and a giant robot punches into them with a voice yelling out, Go Lepardin, the god of demons, the emperor of death. I am the emissary of hell. The robot then stands up and it kicks one of the monsters as a Japanese Spider-Man jumps onto its shoulder and yells, Spider-Man! But in Japanese. Miles looks up stating, Takaya will do. I can go. I'll help. I, I, I can go find anime. And Spider-Zero looks over. I don't know why, but I did not expect him. 
while all of the other Spider-Men are handling the monsters, Miles and Spider-Zero begin to try and figure out how they're going to untangle this and free Ani May. The two of them can't figure it out, so Spider-Zero puts her hands into the tangle, asking if it can hear her. A shock of pain rushes through the young girl as she relays what it's saying. Hurt, hurt, only hurt, must protect, protect the pattern maker from the hurt. Spider-Zero tries to tell the Tangle that they are there to help, that she knows what it's like to be in pain, to be afraid, to lose everything. Spider-Zero shares her life, and the Tangle finally begins to unravel as it finally begins to understand. And as the Tangle is unraveling, it begins to pull Miles in. It pulls Miles to the center where Annie Mae is being held. Miles calls out to her, and she asks if it's him. But the Tangle screams, no, hurt, protect. Spider-Zero tells the Tangle, if it keeps Annie Mae in here, it will kill her. The web needs her back. So Miles and Annie Mae pulled themselves out. She wants to know how, but no one knows what they did or how they managed to get away. But Annie does know that she is the pattern maker and that she can fix this. The Tangle cries out alone, and Spider Zero tells the Tangle, no, she will stay. Annie Mae tells everyone that she appreciates them all coming to help, but it's time for them all to go home. The ethereal tethers reach out, grabbing all of the Spider-Men, pulling them back to their home worlds. And as everyone disappears, Miles notices that Spider-Zero also isn't there. The Tangle tells them, no more hurt. And Spider-Zero tells it, no more hurt, no more alone. I told you, I would stay with you. As Spider-Zero is pulled into the nothingness with the Tangle, Miles reaches out, grabbing her with a thwip. Everyone is yanked back onto solid ground, and Miles asks if the tangle is gone. And Spider Zero says, yeah, it became undone. It wasn't evil. It was just scared, in pain, and lonely. And there's a lot of that out there. And Annie Mae says that that is why there are spider people at all times. Everyone says their goodbyes as Miles returns home. Spider Zero tells herself that on whatever world, whoever they are, spider people are here to help. And there you have it, all three of the Spider-Verse storylines. Spider-Verse, Spider-Geddon, and Spider-Verse 3. I hope you guys enjoyed. I wasn't planning on putting this out so quickly, but there's not a really a better time since they just announced the new movie. And there's another movie coming out very soon. So on that note, guys, I will see you next time right here at Comic Story. And please consider subscribing. Hit that like button and turn on your notifications to know when we bring you videos. We bring you two to five a week right here. And thank you so much for your support. I'll see you next time.